Section 15 of The Chemistry of Cookery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. The Chemistry of Cookery by W. Matthew Williams. Count Rumford's Cookery and Cheap Dinners. I must not leave the subject of vegetable cookery without describing Count Rumford's achievements in feeding the paupers, rogues, and vagabonds of Munich. An account of this is the more desirable from the fact that the soup which formed the basis of his dietary is still misunderstood in this country, for reasons that I shall presently state. After reorganizing the Bavarian army, not only as regards military discipline, but in the feeding, clothing, education, and useful employment of the men, in order to make them good citizens as well as good soldiers, he attacked a still more difficult problem, that of removing from Bavaria the scandal and burden of the hordes of beggars and thieves which had become intolerable. He tells us that the number of itinerant beggars of both sexes and all ages, as well foreigners as natives, who strolled about the country in all directions, levying contributions from the industrious inhabitants, stealing and robbing, and leading a life of indolence and most shameless debauchery, was quite incredible. And further, that these detestable vermin swarmed everywhere, and not only their impudence and clamorous importunity were without any bounds, but they had recourse to the most diabolical acts and most horrid crimes in the prosecution of their infamous trade. Young children were stolen from their parents by these wretches, and their eyes put out, or their tender limbs broken and distorted, in order, by exposing them thus maimed, to excite the pity and commiseration of the public. He gives further particulars of their trading upon the misery of their own children, and their organization to obtain alms by systematic intimidation. Previous attempts to cure the evil had failed, the public had lost all faith in further projects, and therefore no support was to be expected for Rumford's scheme. Aware of this, he says, I took my measures accordingly. To convince the public that the scheme was feasible, I determined first, by a great exertion, to carry it into complete execution, and then to ask them to support it. He describes the military organization by which he distributed the army throughout the country districts to capture all the strolling provincial beggars, and how, on January 1st, 1790, he bagged all the beggars of Munich in less than an hour by means of a well-organized civil and military battue, New Year's Day being the great festival when all the beggars went abroad to enforce their customary blackmail upon the industrious section of the population. Though very interesting, I must not enter upon these details, but cannot help stepping a little aside from my proper subject to quote his weighty words on the ethical principles upon which he proceeded. He says that, with persons of this description, it is easy to be conceived that precepts, admonitions, and punishments would be of little avail, but where precepts fail, habits may sometimes be successful. To make vicious and abandoned people happy, it has generally been supposed necessary, first, to make them virtuous. But why not reverse this order? Why not make them first happy and then virtuous? If happiness and virtue be inseparable, the end will as certainly be attained by one method as by the other, and it is most undoubtedly much easier to contribute to the happiness and comfort of persons in a state of poverty and misery than by admonitions and punishments to improve their morals. He applied these principles to his miserable material with complete success, and referring to the result, exclaims, Would to God that my success might encourage others to follow my example. Further examination of his proceedings shows that, in order to follow such example, a knowledge of first principles and a determination to carry them out in bold defiance of vulgar ignorance, general prejudice, and, vilest of all, polite sneering, is necessary. Having captured the beggars thus cleverly, he proceeded to carry out the above-stated principle by taking them to a large building already prepared, where everything was done that could be devised to make them really comfortable. The first condition of such comfort, he maintains, is cleanliness, and his dissertation on this, though written so long ago, might be quoted in letters of gold by our sanitarians of today. Describing how he carried out his principles, he says of the prisoners thus captured, Most of them had been used to living in the most miserable hovels, in the midst of vermin and every kind of filthiness, or to sleep in the streets and under the hedges, half-naked and exposed to all the inclemencies of the seasons. A large and commodious building, fitted up in the neatest and most comfortable manner, was now provided for their reception. In this agreeable retreat they found spacious and elegant apartments, kept with the most scrupulous neatness, well warmed in winter and well lighted, a good warm dinner every day, gratis, cooked and served up with all possible attention to order and cleanliness, materials and utensils for those that were able to work, masters gratis for those who required instruction, the most generous pay, in money, for all the labor performed, and the kindest usage from every person, from the highest to the lowest, belonging to the establishment. Here in this asylum for the indigent and unfortunate, 
No ill usage, no harsh language is permitted. During five years that the establishment has existed, not a blow has been given to anyone, not even to a child by his instructor. This appears like the very expensive scheme of a benevolent utopian, but to set my readers at rest on this point, I will anticipate a little by stating that, although at first some expense was incurred, all this was finally repaid, and at the end of six years there remained a net profit of a hundred thousand florins, after expenses of every kind, salaries, wages, repairs, etc. had been deducted. When will our workhouses be administered with similar results? I must not dwell upon his devices for gradually inveigling the lazy creatures into habits of industry, for he understood human nature too well to adopt the jailer's theory, which assumes that every able-bodied man can do a day's work daily, in spite of previous habits. Rumford's patients became industrious ultimately, but were not made so at once. This development of industry was one of the elements of financial and moral success, and the next in importance was the economy of the commissariat, which depended on Rumford's skillful cookery of the cheapest viands, rendering them digestible, nutritious, and palatable. Had he adopted the dietary of an English workhouse or an English prison, his financial success would have been impossible and his patients would have been no better fed nor better able to work. The staple food was what he called a soup, but I find, on following out his instructions for making it, that I obtain a porridge rather than a soup. He made many experiments and says, I constantly found that the richness or quality of a soup depended more upon a proper choice of the ingredients and a proper management of fire in the combination of these ingredients than upon the quantity of solid nutritious matter employed, much more upon the art and skill of the cook than upon the sum laid out in the market. Our vegetarian friends will be interested in learning that at first he used meat in the soup provided for the beggars, but gradually omitted it, and the change was unnoticed by those who ate, and no difference was observable as regards its nutrition value. In 1790, little or rather nothing was known of the chemistry of food. Oxygen had been discovered only 16 years before, and chemical analysis, as now understood, was an unknown art. In spite of this, Rumsford selected as the basis of his soup just that proximate element which we now know to be one of the most nutritious that he could have obtained from either the animal or vegetable kingdom, viz. casein. He not only selected this, but he combined it with those other constituents of food which our highest refinements of modern practical chemistry and physiology have proved to be exactly what are required to supplement the casein and constitute a complete dietary. By selecting the cheapest form of casein and the cheapest sources of the other constituents, he succeeded in supplying the beggars with good hot dinners daily at the cost of less than one half penny each. The cost of the mess for the barbarian soldiers under his command was rather more, viz. two pens daily, three farthings of this being devoted to pure luxuries such as beer, etc. Some of his chemical speculations, however, have not been confirmed. The composition of water had just been discovered, and he found by experience that a given quantity of solid food was more satisfying to the appetite and more effective in nutrition when made into soup by long boiling with water. This led him to suppose that the water itself was decomposed by cookery, and its elements recombined or united with other elements, and thus became nutritious by being converted into the tissues of plants and animals. Thus, speaking of the barley, which formed an important constituent of his soup, he says, It requires, it is true, a great deal of boiling, but when it is properly managed, it thickens a vast quantity of water, and, as I suppose, prepares it for decomposition. We now know that this idea of decomposing water by such means is a mistake, but in my own opinion, there is something behind it which still remains to be learned by modern chemists. In my endeavors to fathom the rationale of these changes which occur in cookery, I have been, as my readers will remember, continually driven into hypotheses of hydration, i.e. of supposing that some of the water used in cookery unites to form true chemical compounds with certain of the constituents of the food. As already stated, when I commenced this subject, I had no idea of its suggestiveness, of the wide field of research which it has opened out. One of these subjects of research is the determination of the nature of this hydration of cooked gelatin, fibrin, cellulose, casein, starch, legumin, etc. That water is with them when they are cooked is evident enough, but whether that water is brought into actual chemical combination with them, in such wise as to form the new compounds of additional nutritive value, proportionate to the chemical addition of water, demands so much investigation that I have been driven to merely theorize where I ought to have demonstrated. The fact that the living body, which our food is building up and renewing, contains about 80% of water, some of it combined, some of it uncombined, has a notable bearing on the question. We may yet learn that hydration and dehydration have more to do with the vital functions than has hitherto been supposed. The following are the ingredients used by Rumford in soup number one. Four virtuals of pearl barley equal to about 20 and a third gallons. Weight, 141 pounds, 2 ounces. Cost, 11 shillings, Seven and a half pence.
Four virtuals of peas. Weight, 131 pounds, 4 ounces. Cost, 7 shillings, 3 and a quarter pence. Cuttings of fine wheat and bread. Weight, 69 pounds, 10 ounces. Cost, 10 shillings, 2 and a fourth pence. Salt. Weight, 19 pounds, 13 ounces. Cost, 1 shilling, 2 and a half pence. 24 moss, very weak beer, vinegar, or rather small beer turned sour, about 24 quarts. Weight, 46 pounds, 13 ounces. Cost, 1 shilling, 5 and a half pence. Water, about 560 quarts. Weight, 1,077 pounds, 0 ounces. Cost, none. Total weight, 1,485 pounds, 10 ounces. Total cost, 1 pound, 11 shillings, 9 pence. Fuel, 88 pounds dry pine wood. Cost, 2 and a quarter pence. Wages of three cook maids at 20 florins a year each. Cost, 3 and two thirds pence. Daily expense of feeding the three cook maids at 10 kreutzers, 3 and two thirds pence sterling each according to agreement. Cost, 11 pence. Daily wages of two men servants. Cost, 1 shilling, 7 and a quarter pence. Repairs of kitchen furniture, 90 florins per annuum, daily. Cost, 5 and a half pence. Total daily expenses when dinner is provided for 1,200 persons. 1 pound, 15 shillings, 2 and two thirds pence. This amounts to 422 over 1,200, or a trifle more than a third of a penny for each diner of this number one soup. The cost was still further reduced by the use of the potato, then a novelty, concerning which Rumford makes the following remarks now very curious. So strong was the aversion of the public, particularly the poor, against them at the time when we began to make use of them in the public kitchen of the House of Industry in Munich, that we were absolutely obliged, at first, to introduce them by stealth. A private room in a retired corner was fitted up as a kitchen for cooking them, and it was necessary to disguise them by boiling them down entirely and destroying their form and texture to prevent their being detected. The following are the ingredients of soup number two, with potatoes. Two viertels of pearl barley. Weight, 70 pounds. 9 ounces. Cost, 5 shillings, 9 and 13 over 22 pence. Two viertels of peas. Weight, 65 pounds, 10 ounces. Cost, 3 shillings, 7 and 5 eighths pence. Eight viertels of potatoes. Weight, 230 pounds, 4 ounces. Cost, 1 shilling, 9 and 9 elevenths pence. Cuttings of bread. Weight, 69 pounds, 10 ounces. Cost, 10 shillings, 2 and 4 elevenths pence. Salt, 19 pounds, 13 ounces. Cost, 1 shilling, 2 and a half pence. Vinegar. Weight, 46 pounds, 13 ounces. Cost, 1 shilling, 5 and a half pence. Water. Weight, 982 pounds, 15 ounces. Fuel, servants, repairs, etc. as before. Cost, 3 shillings, 5 and 5 twelfths pence. Daily cost of 1,200 dinners, 1 pound, 7 shillings, 6 and 2 thirds pence. This reduces the cost to a little above 1 farthing per dinner. In the essay from which the above is quoted, there is another account reducing all the items to what they would cost in London in November 1795, which raises the amount to 2 and 3 quarter farthings per portion for number 1 and 2 and a half farthings for number 2. In this estimate, the expenses for fuel, servants, kitchen furniture, etc. are stated at three times as much the cost at Munich, and the other items at the prices stated in the printed report of the Board of Agriculture of November 10th, 1795. But since 1795, we have made great progress in the right direction. Bread then costs one shilling per loaf, barley and peas about 50% more than at present, salt is set down by Rumsford at one and a quarter pence per pound, now about one farthing. Fuel was also dearer. But wages have risen greatly. As stated in money, they are about doubled. In purchasing power, i.e. real wages, they are threefold. Making all these allowances, charging wages at six times those paid by him, I find that the present cost of Rumford's number one soup would be a little over one half penny per portion, and number two just about one half penny. I here assume that Rumford's directions for the construction of kitchen fireplaces and economy of fuel are carried out. We are in these matters still a century behind his arrangements of 1790, and nothing short of a coal famine will punish and cure our criminal extravagance. The cookery of the above-named ingredients is conducted as follows. The water and pearl barley first put together in the boiler and made to boil. The peas are then added, and the boiling is continued over a gentle fire about two hours. 
The potatoes are then added, peeled, and the boiling is continued for about one hour more, during which time the contents of the boiler are frequently stirred about with a large wooden spoon or ladle in order to destroy the texture of the potatoes and to reduce the soup to one uniform mass. When this is done, the vinegar and salt are added, and last of all, at the moment that it is to be served up, the cuttings of bread. Number one is to be cooked for three hours without the potatoes. As already stated, I have found in carrying out these actions that I obtain a puree or porridge rather than a soup. I found the number one to be excellent, number two inferior. It was better when very small potatoes were used, as they became more jellied, and the puree altogether had less of the granular texture of mashed potatoes. I found it necessary to conduct the whole of the cooking myself, the inveterate kitchen superstition concerning simmering and boiling, the belief that anything rapidly boiling is hotter than when it simmers, and is therefore cooking more quickly, compels the non-scientific cook to shorten the tedious three-hour process by boiling. This boiling drives the water from below, bakes the lower stratum of the porridge, and spoils the whole. The ordinary cook, were she at the strapado, or all the racks in the world, would not keep anything barely boiling for three hours with no visible result. According to her positive and superlative experience, the mess is cooked sufficiently in one-third of the time, as soon as the peas are softened. She don't, and she won't, and she can't, and she shan't, understand anything about hydration. When it's done, it's done, and there's an end to it, and what more do you want? Hence the failures of the attempts to introduce Rumford's porridge in our English workhouses, prisons, and soup kitchens. I find when I make it myself that it is incomparably superior and far cheaper than the skilly at present provided, though the sample of skilly that I tasted was superior to the ordinary slop. The weight of each portion of served to the beggars, etc., was 19.9 ounces, one Bavarian pound. The solid matter contained was 6 ounces of number 2, or 4 and 3 quarter ounces of number 1, and Rumford states that this is quite sufficient to make a good meal for a strong, healthy person, as abundantly proved by long experience. He insists again and again upon the necessity of the three hours cooking, and I am equally convinced of its necessity, though, as above explained, not on the same theoretical grounds. No repetition of his experience is fair unless this be attended to. I have no hesitation in affirming that the four and three quarter ounces of number one, when thus boiled for three hours, will supply more nutriment than six ounces boiled only one and a half hour. The bread should not be cooked, but added just before serving the soup. In reference to this, he has published a very curious essay entitled, on the pleasure of eating and the means that may be employed for increasing it. Rumford used wood as fuel, and his kitchen ranges were constructed of brickwork with a separate fire for each pot, the pot being set in the brickwork immediately above the fireplace, in such manner that the flame and heated products of combustion surrounded the pot on their way to the exit flue. The quantity of fuel was adjusted to each operation, and with wood embers, a long-sustained moderate heat was easily obtained. With coal fires, such separate firing would be troublesome, as coal cannot be so easily kindled on requirement as wood. With our roaring wasteful kitchen furnaces and still more wasteful cooks, the long-sustained moderate heat is not practicable without some further advice. I found that by using a milk scalder, which is a water bath similar to a glue pot, but on a large scale, I could obtain Rumford's results over a common kitchen range with very little trouble, and no risk of baking the bottom part of the porridge. I further found that even a longer period of stewing than he prescribes is desirable. I made a hearty meal on number one soup, and found it as satisfactory as any dinner of meat, potatoes, etc., of any number of courses, and, as a chemist, I assert without any hesitation that such a meal is demonstrably of equal or superior nutritive value to an ordinary Englishman's slice of beef diluted with potatoes. The number two soup is not so satisfactory. Rumford was wrong in his estimate of the value of potatoes. In the formula for Rumford's soup, it is stated that the bread should not be cooked, but added just before serving the soup. Like everything else in his practical programs, this was prescribed with a philosophical reason. His reasons may have been fanciful sometimes, but he never acted stupidly, as the vulgar majority of mankind usually do when they blindly follow an established custom, without knowing any reason for so doing or even attempting to discover a reason. In his essay on the pleasures of eating, and of the means that may be employed for increasing it, he says, The pleasure enjoyed in eating depends, first, on the agreeableness of the taste of the food, and secondly, upon its power to affect the palate. Now, there are many substances extremely cheap, by which very agreeable tastes may be given to food, particularly when the basis or nutritive substance of the food is tasteless, and the effect of any kind of palatable solid food, of meat, for instance, upon the organs of taste may be increased, almost indefinitely, by reducing the size of the particles of such food, and causing it to act upon the palate by a larger surface. And if means be used to prevent it being swallowed too soon, which may easily be done by mixing it with some hard and tasteless substance, such as crumbs of bread rendered hard by toasting, or anything else of that kind, by which a long mastication is rendered necessary, the enjoyment of eating may be greatly increased and prolonged. 
He adds that the idea of occupying a person a great while, and affording him much pleasure at the same time in eating a small quantity of food, may perhaps appear ridiculous to some, but those who consider the matter attentively will perceive that it is very important. It is perhaps as much so as anything that can employ the attention of the philosopher. Further on, he adds, if a glutton can be made to gourmandize two hours upon two ounces of meat, it is certainly much better for him than to give himself an indigestion by eating two pounds in the same time. This is amusing as well as instructive. So also are his researches into what I may venture to describe as the specific sapidity of different kinds of food, which he determined by diluting or intermixing them with insipid materials, and thereby ascertaining the amount of surface over which they might be spread before their particular flavor disappeared. He concluded that a red herring has the highest specific sapidity, i.e. the greatest amount of flavor in a given weight of any kind of food he had tested, and that, comparing it on the basis of cost for cost, its superiority is still greater." He tells us that the pleasure of eating depends very much indeed upon the manner in which the food is applied to the organs of taste, and that he considers it necessary to mention, even to illustrate in the clearest manner, every circumstance which appears to have influence in producing these important effects. As an example of this, I may quote his instructions for eating hasty pudding. The pudding is then eaten with a spoon, each spoonful of it being dipped into the sauce before it is carried to the mouth, care being had in taking it up to begin on the outside, near the brim of the plate, and to approach the center by regular advances, in order not to demolish too soon the excavation which forms the reservoir for the sauce. His solid Indian corn pudding is, in like manner, to be eaten with a knife and fork, beginning at the circumference of the slice, and approaching regularly towards the center, each piece of pudding being taken up with the fork and dipped into the butter, or dipped into it in part only before it is carried to the mouth. As a supplement to the cheap soup recipes, I will quote one which Rumford gives as the cheapest food which, in his opinion, can be provided in England. Take of water eight gallons, mix it with five pounds of barley meal, boil it to the consistency of a thick jelly. Season with salt, vinegar, pepper, sweet herbs, and four red herrings pounded in a mortar. Instead of bread, add five pounds of Indian corn made into samp, and stir it together with a ladle. Serve immediately in portions of 20 ounces. Samp is said to have been invented by the savages of North America who have no corn mills. It is Indian corn deprived of its external coat by soaking it 10 or 12 hours in a lixivium of water and wood ashes. This coat or husk, being separated from the kernel, rises to the surface of the water while the grain remains at the bottom. The separated kernel is stewed for about two days in a kettle of water placed near the fire. When sufficiently cooked, the kernels will be found to be swelled to a great size and burst open, and this food, which is uncommonly sweet and nourishing, may be used in a great variety of ways, but the best way of using it is to mix it with milk, and with soups and broths as a substitute for bread. He prefers it to bread because it requires more mastication, and consequently tends to prolong the pleasure of eating. The cost of this soup he estimates as follows. 5 pounds barley meal at 1.5 pence per pound, or 5 shillings 6 pence per bushel, 7.5 pence. 5 pounds Indian corn at 1.5 pence per pound, 6 and a quarter pence. 4 red herrings, 3 pence. Vinegar, 1 pence. Salt, 1 pence. Pepper and sweet herbs, 2 pence. Total cost, 1 shilling, 8 and 3 quarter pence. This makes 64 portions, which thus cost rather less than one third of a penny each. As prices were higher than, than now, it comes down to little more than one farthing, or one third of a penny, as stated, when cost of preparation and making on a large scale is included. I have not been successful in making the soup, failed in the samp, as explained in the footnote. By substituting raspings, the coarse powder rasped off the surface of rolls or overbaked loaves, or breadcrumbs browned in an oven, I obtain a fair result for those who have no objection to a diffused flavor of red herring. By using grated cheese instead of the herring, as well as substituting breadcrumbs or raspings for the Indian corn, I have completely succeeded, but for economy and quality combined, the number one soup, as supplied at Munich, is preferable. The feeding of the Bavarian soldiers is stated in detail in Volume 1 of Rumford's Essays. I take one characteristic example. It is from an official report on experiments made in obedience to the orders of Lieutenant General Count Rumford by Sergeant Wickelhoff's mess in the first company of the first, or elector's own, regiment of grenadiers at Munich. June 10, 1795, Bill of Fare. Boiled beef with soup and bread dumplings. Details of the expense. First, for the boiled beef and the soup. Two pounds, zero lots of beef. Sixteen kreutzers. One loth of sweet herbs. One kreutzer. A quarter loth of pepper. Half kreutzer. Six lots of salt. Half kreutzer. Fourteen and a half lots of ammunition bread cut fine. Two and seven eighths kreutzers. Nine pounds, twenty lots of water. Zero kreutzers. Total weight, thirteen pounds, nine and three quarter lots. Cost, 
20 and 7 8 kreutzers. The Bavarian pound is a little less than 1 and a quarter pounds and is divided into 32 loths. All these were put in an earthenware pot and boiled for 2 hours and a quarter, then divided into 12 portions of 26 and 7 twelfths loths each, costing 1 and 3 quarters kreutzers. Second, for the bread dumpling. 10 pounds, 13 lots, fine semmel bread, 10 kreutzers. 1 pound, 0 lots of fine flour, 4.5 kreutzers. 6 lots of salt, half a kreutzer. 3 pounds of water, 0 kreutzers. Total weight, 5 pounds, 19 lots. Total cost, 15 kreutzers. This mass was made into dumplings, which were boiled half an hour in clear water. Upon taking them out of the water, they were found to weigh 5 pounds, 24 lots, giving 15 and a third lots to each portion, costing 1 and 1 fourth kreutzer. The meat, soup, and dumplings were served all at once in the same dish and were all eaten together at dinner. Each member of the mess was also supplied with 10 lots of rye bread, which cost 5 sixteenths of a kreutzer. Also with 10 lots of the same for breakfast, another piece of same weight in the afternoon, and another for his supper. A detailed analysis of this is given, the sum total of which shows that each man received an avoirdupois weight daily. 2 pounds, 2 and 34 over 100 ounces of solids. 1 pound, 2 and 84 over 100 ounces of prepared water. Total weight, 3 pounds, 15 and 18 over 100 ounces of total solids and fluids, which cost 5 and 17 over 48 kreutzers, or 2 pence sterling, very nearly. Other bills of fare of other messes officially reported give about the same. This is exclusive of the cost of fuel, etc. for cooking. All who are concerned in soup kitchens or other economic dietaries should carefully study the details supplied in these essays of Count Rumford. They are thoroughly practical, and, although nearly a century old, are highly instructive at the present day. With their aid, large basins of good nutritious soup might be supplied at one penny per basin, leaving a profit for establishment expenses, and if such were obtainable at Billingsgate, Smithfield, Leadenhall, Covent Garden, and other markets in London and the provinces, where poor men are working at early hours on cold mornings, the dram drinking which prevails so fatally in such places would be more effectually superseded than by any temperance missions, which are limited to mere talking. Such soup is incomparably better than tea or coffee. It should be included in the bill of fare of all the coffee palaces and such like establishments. Since the above appeared in knowledge, I have had much correspondence with ladies and gentlemen who are benevolently exerting themselves in the good work of providing cheap dinners for poor school children and poor people generally. I may mention particularly the Reverend W. Moore Ede, rector of Gateshead on Tyne, a pioneer in the penny dinner movement, and who has published a valuable penny tract on the subject, Cheap Food and Cheap Cookery, which I recommend to all his fellow workers. He supplies distribution copies at six pence per 100. His penny dinner cooker, now commercially supplied by Messrs. Walker and Emily, Newcastle, overcomes the difficulties I have described in the slow cookery of Rumford soup. It is a double vessel on the glue pot principle, heated by gas. End of section 15. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio. Section 16 of The Chemistry of Cookery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ashley Jane. The Chemistry of Cookery by W. Matthew Williams. Count Rumford's Substitute for Tea and Coffee Take eight parts by weight of meal, Rumford says white or rye meal, and I add or oatmeal, and one part of butter. Melt the butter in a clean iron frying pan, and when thus melted, sprinkle the meal into it. Stir the whole briskly with a broad wooden spoon or spatula till the butter has disappeared and the meal is of a uniform brown colour, like roasted coffee, great care being taken to prevent burning on the bottom of the pan. About half an ounce of this roasted meal boiled in a pint of water and seasoned with salt, pepper and vinegar forms burnt soup, much used by the woodcutters of Bavaria, who work in the mountains far away from any habitations. Their provisions for a week, the time they commonly remain in the mountains, 
consist of a large loaf of rye bread, which, as it does not so soon grow dry and stale as wheaten bread, is always preferred to it. A linen bag containing a small quantity of roasted meal prepared as above, another small bag of salt, and a small wooden box containing some pounded black pepper, and sometimes, but not often, a small bottle of vinegar. But black pepper is an ingredient never omitted. The rye bread, which eaten alone or with cold water would be very hard fare, is rendered palatable and satisfactory. Rumford thinks also more wholesome and nutritious, by the help of a bowl of hot soup, so easily prepared from the roasted meal. He tells us that this is not only used by the woodcutters, but that it is also the common breakfast of the Bavarian peasant, and adds that it is infinitely preferable in all respects to that most pernicious wash, tea, with which the lower classes of the inhabitants of this island drench their stomachs and ruin their constitutions. He adds that when tea is taken with a sufficient quantity of sugar and good cream and with a large quantity of bread and butter or with toast and boiled eggs and above all when it is not drunk too hot it is certainly less unwholesome. But a simple infusion of this drug, drunk boiling hot, as the poor usually take it, is certainly a poison, which though it is sometimes slow in its operation, never fails to produce fatal effects, even in the strongest constitutions, where the free use of it is continued for a considerable length of time. This may appear to many a very strong condemnation of their favourite beverage. Nevertheless, I am satisfied that it is sound, and my opinion is not hastily adopted nor borrowed from Rumford, but a conclusion based upon many observations, extending over a long period of years, and confirmed by experiments made upon myself. I therefore strongly recommend this substitute, especially as so many of us have to submit to the beneficent domestic despotism of the gentler and more persevering sex, one of the common forms of this despotism being that of not permitting its male victim to drink cold water at breakfast. This burnt soup has the further advantage of rendering imperative the boiling of the water, a most important precaution against the perils of sewage contamination, not removable by mere filtration. The experience of every confirmed tea drinker, when soundly interpreted, supplies condemnation of his beverage, the plea commonly urged on its behalf being, when understood, an eloquent expression of such condemnation. It is so refreshing, I am fit for nothing when tea time comes round until I have had my tea and then I am fit for anything. The fit for nothing state comes on at 5pm when the drug is taken at the orthodox time or even in the early morning in the case of those who are accustomed to have a cup of tea brought to their bedside before rising. Some will even plead for tea by telling that, by its aid, one can sit up all night long at brain work without feeling sleepy, provided ample supplies of the infusion are taken from time to time. It is unquestionably true that such may be done, that the tea drinker is languid and weary by tea time, whatever be the hour, and that the refreshment produced by the cup that cheers and is said not to inebriate, is almost instantaneous. What is the true significance of these facts? The refreshment is certainly not due to nutrition, not to the rebuilding of any worn-out or exhausted organic tissue. The total quantity of material conveyed from the tea leaves into the water is ridiculously too small for the performance of any such nutritive function. And besides this, the action is far too rapid, 
there is not sufficient time for the conversion of even that minute quantity into organised working tissue. The action cannot be that of a food, but is purely and simply that of a stimulating or irritant drug acting directly and abnormally on the nervous system. The five o'clock lassitude and craving is neither more nor less than the reaction induced by the habitual abnormal stimulation, or otherwise, and quite fairly stated, it is the outward symptom of a diseased condition of brain produced by the action of a drug. It may be but a mild form of disease, but it is truly a disease nevertheless. The active principle which produces this result is the crystalline alkaloid, the theine, a compound belonging to the same class as strychnine and a number of similar vegetable poisons. These, when diluted, act medicinally. That is, produce disturbance of normal functions as the tea does, and, like theine, most of them act specially on the nervous system. When concentrated, they are dreadful poisons, very small doses causing death. The volatile oil, of which tea contains about 1%, probably contributes to this effect. Johnston attributes the headaches and giddiness to which tea tasters are subject to this oil, and also the attacks of paralysis to which, after a few years, those who are employed in packing and unpacking chests of tea are found to be liable. As both the alkaloid and the oil are volatile, I suspect that they jointly contribute to these disturbances, the narcotic business being done by the volatile oil, the paralysis supplied by the alkaloid. The non-tea drinker does not suffer any of the five o'clock symptoms, and, if otherwise in sound health, remains in steady working condition until his day's work is ended and the time for rest and sleep arrives. But the habitual victim of any kind of drug or disturber of normal functions acquires a diseased condition, displayed by the loss of vitality or other deviation from normal function, which is temporarily relieved by the usual dose of the drug, but only in such wise as to generate a renewed craving. I include in this general statement all the vice drugs, to coin a general name, such as alcohol, opium, tobacco, whether smoke, chewed or snuffed, arsenic, hashish, betel nut, coca leaf, thorn apple, Siberian fungus, mate, etc., all of which are excessively refreshing to their victims, and of which the use may be, and has been, defended by the same arguments as those used by the advocates of habitual tea-drinking. Speaking generally, the reaction or residual side effect of these on the system is nearly the opposite of that of their immediate effect, and thus larger and larger doses are demanded to bring the system to its normal condition. The non-tea drinker or moderate drinker is kept awake by a cup of tea or coffee taken late at night, while the hard drinker of these beverages scarcely feels any effect, especially if accustomed to take it at that time. The practice of taking tea or coffee by students in order to work at night is downright madness, especially when preparing for an examination. More than half of the cases of breakdown, loss of memory, fainting, etc., which occur during severe examinations, and far more frequently than is commonly known, are due to this. I continually hear of promising students who have thus failed, and, on inquiry, have learned, in almost every instance, that the victim has previously drugged himself with tea or coffee. Sleep is the rest of the brain. To rob the hard-worked brain of its necessary rest is cerebral suicide. My old friend, the late Thomas Wright, the archaeologist, was a victim of this terrible folly. He undertook the translation 
of The Life of Julius Caesar by Napoleon III, and to do it in a cruelly short time. He fulfilled his contract by sitting up several nights successively by the aid of strong tea or coffee, I forget which. I saw him shortly afterwards. In a few weeks he had aged alarmingly, had become quite bald. His brain gave way and never recovered. There was but little difference between his age and mine, and but for this dreadful cerebral strain rendered possible only by the stimulant, for otherwise he would have fallen asleep over his work and thereby saved his life. He might still be amusing and instructing thousands of readers by fresh volumes of popularised archaeological research. I need scarcely add that all I have said above applies to coffee as to tea, though not so seriously in this country. The active alkaloid is the same in both, but tea contains weight for weight above twice as much as coffee. In this country we commonly use about 50%, more coffee than tea, to each given measure of water. On the continent they use about double our quantity. This is the true secret of coffee as in France, and thus produce as potent an infusion as our tea. I need scarcely add that the above remarks are exclusively applied to the habitual use of these stimulants. As medicines, used occasionally and judiciously, they are invaluable, provided always that they are not used as ordinary beverages. In Italy, Greece and some parts of the East, it is customary, when anybody feels ill with indefinite symptoms, to send to the druggist for a dose of tea. From what I have seen of its action on non-tea drinkers, it appears to be specially potent in arresting the premonitory symptoms of fever, the fever headache, etc. Since the publication of the above in Knowledge, I have been reminded of the high authorities who have defended the use of the alkaloids, and more particularly of Liebig's theory, or the theory commonly attributed to Liebig, but which is layman's, produced in Liebig's Annalen, volume 87, and adopted and advocated by Liebig with his usual ability. Layman watched for some weeks the effect of coffee upon two persons in good health. He found that it retarded the waste of the tissues of the body, that the proportion of phosphoric acid and of urea excreted by the kidneys was diminished by the action of the coffee, the diet being in all other respects the same. Pure caffeine, which is the same as theine, produced a similar effect. The aromatic oil of the coffee, given separately, was found to exert a stimulating effect on the nervous system. Johnston, Chemistry of Common Life, closely following Liebig and referring to the researches of Lehman, says, The waste of the body is lessened by the introduction of theine into the stomach, that is, by the use of tea. And if the waste be lessened, the necessity for food to repair it will be lessened in an equal proportion. In other words, by the consumption of a certain quantity of tea, the health and strength of the body will be maintained in an equal degree upon a smaller quantity of ordinary food. Tea, therefore, saves food, stands to a certain extent in the place of food, while at the same time it soothes the body and enlivens the mind. He proceeds to say that, in the old and infirm it serves also another purpose. In the life of most persons a period arrives when the stomach no longer digests enough of the ordinary elements of food to make up for the natural daily waste of the bodily substance. The size and weight of the body, therefore, begin to diminish more or less perceptibly. At this period tea comes in as a medicine to arrest the waste to keep the body from falling away so fast, 
and thus to enable the less energetic powers of digestion still to supply as much as is needed to repair the wear and tear of the solid tissues. No wonder, therefore, says he, that the aged female, who has barely enough income to buy what are called the common necessaries of life, should yet spend a portion of her small gains in purchasing her ounce of tea. She can live quite as well on less common food when she takes her tea along with it, while she feels lighter at the same time, more cheerful and fitter for her work because of the indulgence. The italics are for my own comparison with those that follow. All this is based upon the researches of Lehman and others who measured the work of the vital furnace by the quantity of ashes produced, the urea and phosphoric acid excreted. But there is also another method of measuring the same, that of collecting the expired breath and determining the quantity of carbonic acid given off by combustion. This method is imperfect, inasmuch as it only measures a portion of the carbonic acid which is given off. The skin is also a respiratory organ, cooperating with the lungs in evolving carbonic acid. Dr. Edward Smith adopted the method of measuring the respired carbonic acid only. His results were first published in the Philosophical Transactions of 1859, and again in chapter 35 of his volume on food international scientific series. After stating in the latter the details of the experiments, which include depth of respiration as well as amount of carbonic acid respired, he says, Hence it was proved beyond all doubt that tea is a most powerful respiratory excitant, as it causes an evolution of carbon greatly beyond that which it supplies. It follows that it must powerfully promote those vital changes in food which ultimately produce the carbonic acid to be evolved. Instead, therefore, of supplying nutritive matter, it causes the assimilation and transformation of other foods. Now, note the following practical conclusions, which I quote in Dr. Smith's own words, but take the liberty of rendering in italics those passages that I wish the reader to specially compare with the preceding quotations from Johnston. In reference to nutrition, we may say that tea increases waste since it promotes the transformation of food without supplying nutriment and increases the loss of heat without supplying fuel, and it is therefore especially adapted to the wants of those who usually eat too much and after a full meal, when the process of assimilation should be quickened, but is less adapted to the poor and ill-fed and during fasting. He tells us very positively that to take tea before a meal is as absurd as not to take it after a meal, unless the system be at all times replete with nutritive material. And again, our experiments have sufficed to show how tea may be injurious if taken with deficient food, and thereby exaggerate the evils of the poor. And again, the conclusions at which we arrived after our researches in 1858 were that tea should not be taken without food, unless after a full meal, or with insufficient food, or by the young or very feeble, and that its essential action is to waste the system or consume food by promoting vital action which it does not support, and they have not been disproved by any subsequent scientific researches. This final assertion may be true, and to those who go in for the last thing out, the latest novelty or fashion in science, literature or millinery, the absence of any refutation of later date is quite enough. But how about the previous scientific researches of Lehman, who on all such subjects is about the highest authority that can be quoted? 
His three volumes on physiological chemistry, translated and republished by the Cavendish Society, stand pre-eminent as the best written, most condensed and complete work on the subject, and his original researches constitute a lifetime's work, not of mere random change-ringing among the elements of obscure and insignificant organic compounds, but of judiciously selected chemical work having definite philosophical aims and objects. It is evident from the passages I have emphatically quoted that Dr. Smith flatly contradicts Lehman and arrives at directly contradictory physiological results and practical inferences. Are we, therefore, to conclude that he has blundered in his analysis or that Lehman has done so. On carefully comparing the two sets of investigations, I conclude that there is no necessary contradiction in the facts, that both may be, and in all probability are, quite correct as regards their chemical results, but that Dr. Smith has only attacked half the problem, while Lehman has grasped the whole. All the popular stimulants, refreshing drugs and pick-me-ups have two distinct and opposite actions. An immediate exhortation, which lasts for a certain period, varying with the drug and the constitution of its victim, and a subsequent depression proportionate to the primary exhortation, but, as I believe, always exceeding it either in duration or intensity, or both, thus giving as a net or mean result a loss of vitality. Dr. Smith's experiments only measured the carbonic acid exhaled from the lungs during the first stage, the period of exhortation. His experiments were extended to 50 minutes, 71 minutes, 65 minutes, and in one case, to one hour and fifty minutes. It is worthy of note that in experiment one, one hundred grains of black tea were given to two persons and the duration of the experiment was fifty and seventy-one minutes. The average increase was seventy-one and sixty-eight cubic inches per minute, while in number six, with the same dose and the carbonic acid collected during one hour and fifty minutes, the average increase per minute was only 47.5 cubic inches. These indicate a decline of the exhortation, and the curves on his diagrams show the same. His coffee results were similar. We know that the refreshing action of tea often extends over a considerable period. My own experiments on myself show that it continues about three or four hours, and that of beer or wine less than one hour, moderate doses in each case. I have tested this by walking measured distances after taking the stimulant and comparing with my walking powers when taking no other beverage than cold water. The duration of the tea stimulation has been also measured, painfully so, by the duration of sleeplessness when female seduction has led me to drink tea late in the evening. The duration of coffee is about one-third less than tea. Lehman's experiments, extending over weeks, days instead of minutes, measured the whole effect of the alkaloid and oil of the coffee during both the periods of exaltation and depression, and therefore supplied a mean or total result which accords with ordinary everyday experience. It is well known that the pot of tea of the poor needlewoman subdues the natural craving for food. The habitual smoker claims the same merit for his pipe and the chewer for his quid. Wonderful stories are told of the long abstinence of the drinkers of mate, chewers of betel nut, Siberian fungus, coca leaf and pepperwort, and the smokers and eaters of hashish, etc. Not only is the sense of hunger allayed, but less food is demanded of sustaining life. 
It is a curious fact that similar effects should be produced and similar advantages claimed for the use of a drug which is totally different in its other chemical properties and relations. White arsenic, or arsenous acid, is the oxide of a metal, and far as the poles asunder from the alkaloids, alcohols, and aromatic resins in chemical classification. But it does check the waste of the tissues, and is eaten by the styrians and others with physiological effects, curiously resembling those of its chemical antipodians above named. Foremost among these physiological effects is that of making the food appear to go further. It is strange that Liebig or any physiologist who accepts his views of vital chemistry should claim this diminution of the normal waste and renewal of tissue as a merit, seeing that, according to Liebig, life itself is the product of such change and death the result of its cessation. But in the eagerness that has been displayed to justify existing indulgences, this claim has been extensively made by men who ought to know better than to admit such a plea. I speak, as before, as the habitual use of such drugs, not of their occasional medicinal use. The waste of the body may be going on with killing rapidity, as in fever, and then such medicines may save life, provided always that the body has not become tolerant or partially insensible to them by daily usage. I once watched a dangerous case of typhoid fever. Acting under the instructions of skilful medical attendants and aided by a clinical thermometer and a second's watch, I so applied small doses of brandy at short intervals as to keep down both pulse and temperature within the limits of fatal combustion. The patient had scarcely tasted alcohol before this, and therefore it exerted its maximum efficacy. I was surprised at the certain response of both pulse and temperature to this most valuable medicine and most pernicious beverage. The argument that has been the most industriously urged in favour of all the vice drugs, and each in its turn, is that miserable apology that has been made for every folly, every vice, every political abuse, every social crime, such as slavery, polygamy, etc., when the time has arrived for reformation. I cannot condescend to seriously argue against it, but merely state that the fact that the widely diffused practice of using some kind of stimulating drug has been claimed as a sufficient proof of the necessity or advantage of such practice. I leave my readers to bestow on such a plea the treatment they may think it deserves. Those who believe that a rational being should have rational grounds for his conduct will treat this customary refuge of blind conservatism as I do. I recommend tea drinkers who desire to practically investigate the subject for themselves to repeat the experiment that I have made. After establishing the habit of taking tea at a particular hour, suddenly relinquish it altogether. The result will be more or less unpleasant, in some cases seriously so. My symptoms were a dull headache and intellectual sluggishness during the remainder of the day, and if compelled to do any brain work, such as lecturing or writing, I did it badly. This, as I have already said, is the diseased condition induced by the habit. These symptoms vary with the amount of the customary indulgence and the temperament of the individual. A rough, lumbering, insensible navvy may drink a quart or two of tea, or a few gallons of beer, or several quarterns of gin, with but small results of any kind. I know an omnibus driver who makes seven double journeys daily, and his reglers a half a quartern of gin at each terminus i.e. one and three-quarter pints daily, exclusive of extras. This would render most men helplessly drunk, 
but he has never drunk and drives well and safely. Assuming, then, that the experimenter has taken sufficient daily tea to have a sensible effect, he will suffer on leaving it off. Let him persevere in the discontinuance, in spite of brain languor and dull headache. He will find that day by day the languor will diminish, and in the course of time, about a fortnight or three weeks in my case, he will be weaned. He will retain from morning to night the full, free and steady use of all his faculties. Will get through his day's work without any fluctuation of working ability, provided, of course, no other stimulant is used. Instead of his best faculties being dependent on a drug for their awakening, he will be in the condition of true manhood, i.e. able to do his best in any direction of effort simply in reply to moral demand, able to do whatever is right and advantageous because his reason shows that is so. The sense of duty is to such a free man the only stimulus demanded for calling forth his uttermost energies. If he again returns to his habitual tea, he will again be reduced to more or less of dependence upon it. This condition of dependence is a state of disease precisely analogous to that which is induced by opium and other drugs that operate by temporary abnormal cerebral exaltation. The pleasurable sensations enjoyed by the opium eater or smoker or morphia injector are more intense than those of the tea drinker and the reaction proportionally greater. I must not leave this subject without a word or two in reference to a widely prevailing and very mischievous fallacy. Many argue and actually believe that because a given drug has great efficiency in curing disease, it must do good if taken under ordinary conditions of health. No high authorities are demanded for the refutation of this. A little common sense properly used is quite sufficient. It is evident that a medicine, properly so called, is something which is capable of producing a disturbing or alterative effect on the body generally or some particular organ. The skill of the physician consists in so applying this disturbing agency as to produce an alteration of the state of disease a direct conversion of the state of disease to a state of health, if possible, which is rarely the case, or more usually the conversion of one state of disease into another of milder character. But when we are in a state of sound health, any disturbance or alteration must be a change for the worse, must throw us out of health to an extent proportionate to the potency of the drug. I might illustrate this by a multitude of familiar examples, but they would carry me too far away from my proper subject. There is, however, one class of such remedies which are directly connected with the chemistry of cookery. I refer to the condiments that act as tonics, excluding common salt, which is an article of food, though often miscalled a condiment. Salt is food simply because it supplies the blood with one of its normal and necessary constituents, chloride of sodium, without which we cannot live. A certain quantity of it exists in most of our ordinary food, but not always sufficient. Cayenne pepper may be selected as a typical example of a condiment properly so called. Mustard is a food and condiment combined. This is the case with some others. Curry powders are mixtures of very potent condiments with more or less of farinaceous materials and sulphur compounds which, like the oil of mustard, of onions, garlic, etc., may have a certain amount of special nutritive value. The mere condiment is a stimulating drug that does its work directly upon the inner lining of the stomach by exciting it 
to increased and abnormal activity. A dyspeptic may obtain immediate relief by using cayenne pepper. Among the advertised patent medicines is a pill bearing the very ominous name of its compounder, the active constituent of which is cayenne. Great relief and temporary comfort is commonly obtained by using it as a dinner pill. If thus used only as a temporary remedy for an acute and temporary or exceptional attack of indigestion, all is well. But the cayenne whether taken in pills or dusted over the food or stewed with it in curries or any otherwise, is one of the most cruel of slow poisons when taken habitually. Thousands of poor wretches are crawling miserably towards their graves, the victims of the multitude of maladies, of both mind and body that are connected with chronic, incurable dyspepsia all brought about by the habitual use of cayenne and its condimental cousins. The usual history of these victims is that they began by overfeeding, took the condiment to force the stomach to do more than its healthful amount of work, using but a little at first. Then the stomach became tolerant of this little and demanded more, then more and more, and more, until at last inflammation, ulceration, torpidity, and finally the death of the digestive powers, accompanied with all that long train of miseries to which I have referred. India is their special fatherland. Englishmen, accustomed to an active life at home, and a climate demanding much fuel food for the maintenance of animal heat, go to India, crammed, maybe, with Latin, but ignorant of the laws of health. Cheap servants promote indolence, tropical heat diminishes respiratory oxidation, and the appetite naturally fails. Instead of understanding this failure as an admonition to take smaller quantities of food, or food of less nutritive and combustive value, such as carbohydrates instead of hydrocarbons, and albuminoids, they regard it as a symptom of ill health, and take curries, bitter ale, and other tonics of appetising condiments, which, however mischievous in England, are far more so there. I know several men who have lived rationally in India, and they all agree that the climate is especially favourable to longevity, provided bitter beer and all other alcoholic drinks, all peppery condiments and flesh foods are avoided. The most remarkable example of vigorous old age I have ever met was a retired colonel, 82 years of age, who had risen from the ranks and had been 55 years in India without furlough. Drunk no alcohol during that period, was a vegetarian in India though not so in his native land. I guessed his age to be somewhere about sixty. He was a Scotchman and an ardent student of the works of both George and Dr. Andrew Coombe. A correspondent inquires whether I class cocoa amongst the stimulants. So far as I am able to learn, it should not be so classed, but I cannot speak absolutely. Mere chemistry supplies no answer to this question. It is purely a physiological subject to be studied by observation of effects. Such observations may be made by anybody whose system has not become tolerant of the substance in question. My own experience of cocoa in all its forms is that it is not stimulating in any sensible degree. I have acquired no habit of using it and yet I can enjoy a rich cup or bowl of cocoa or chocolate just before bedtime without losing any sleep. When I am occasionally betrayed into taking a late cup of coffee or tea, I repent it for some hours after going to bed. My inquiries among other people, who are not under the influence of that most powerful of all arguments, the logic of inclination, have confirmed my own experience. I have, however, added that some authorities have attributed exhilarating properties to the theobromine 
or nitrogenous alkaloid of cocoa. Its composition nearly resembles that of theine, as the following, from Johnston, shows. Theine, carbon, 49.8. Hydrogen, 5.08. Nitrogen, 28.3. Oxygen, 16.29 over 100. Theobromine, carbon, 46.43, hydrogen, 4.20, nitrogen, 35.85, oxygen, 13.52, over 100. It exists in the cocoa bean in about the same proportion as the theine in tea, but in making a cup of cocoa we use a much greater weight of cocoa than of tea in a cup of tea. If, therefore, the properties of theobromine were similar to those of theine, we should feel the stimulating effects much more decidedly. The alkaloid of tea and coffee in its pure state has been administered to animals and found to produce paralysis, but I am not aware that theobromine has acted similarly. Another essential difference between cocoa and tea or coffee is that cocoa is, strictly speaking, a food. We do not merely make an infusion of the cacao bean, but eat it bodily in the form of a soup. It is highly nutritious, one of the most nutritious foods in common use. When travelling on foot in mountainous and other regions, where there was a risk of spending the night al fresco and supperless, I have usually carried a cake of chocolate in my knapsack, as the most portable and unchangeable form of concentrated nutriment, and have found it most valuable. On one occasion I went astray on the Jolan Field in Norway, and struggled for about twenty-four hours without food or shelter. I had no chocolate then, and sorely repented my improvidence. Many other pedestrians have tried chocolate in like manner, and all I know have commended its great staying properties, simply regarded as food. I therefore conclude that Linaus was not without strong justification in giving it the name of Theobroma, food for the gods. But to confirm this practically, the pure nut, the whole nut, and nothing but the nut, excepting the milk and sugar added by the consumer, should be used. Some miserable counterfeits are offered, farinaceous paste flavoured with cocoa and sugar. The best sample I have been able to procure is the ship cocoa prepared for the navy. This is nothing but the whole nut unsweetened, ground and crushed to an impalpable paste. It requires a little boiling and when milk alone is used with due proportion of sugar it is a theobroma. Condensed milk diluted and without further sweetening may be used. The following are the results of the analysis of two samples of cocoa by Payen. Cacao butter 48, 50, albumen, fibrin and other nitrogenous matter, 21, 20, theobromine, 4, 2, starch with traces of sugar, 11, 10, cellulose, 3, 2, colouring matter, aromatic essence, traces, mineral matter, water, 10, 12, over 100. The very large proportion of fat shows that the Italians are right in their mode of using their breakfast cup of chocolate. They cut their rolls into fingers and dip it in the aurora instead of spreading butter on it. Vegetable food generally contains an excess of cellulose and a deficiency of fat. 
Therefore, cocoa, with its excess of fat and deficiency of cellulose, is theoretically indicated as a very desirable adjunct to an ordinary vegetarian dietary. The few experiments I have made by perpetrating the culinary hearsay of adding cocoa to oatmeal porridge and other purees to mashed potatoes, turnips, carrots, boiled rice, sago, tapioca, etc., prove that vegetarians have much to learn in the cookery of cocoa. During two months' sojourn in Milan, my daily breakfast consisted of bread, grapes and powdered chocolate. Each grape was bitten across, one half eaten pure and simple, then the cut and pulpy face of the other half was dipped in the chocolate powder and eaten with as much as adhered to it. I have never been better fed. End of section 16「ニトリ In an unguarded moment, I promised to include the above in this work, and will do the best I can to fulfill the rash promise. But the utmost result of this effort can only be a contribution to a subject which is too profoundly mysterious to be fully grasped by any intellect that is not sufficiently clairvoyant to penetrate paving stones and see through them to the interiors of the closely tiled cellars wherein the mysteries are manipulated. I will first define what I mean by the cookery of wine. Grape juice in its unfermented state may be described as raw wine, or this name may be applied to the juice after fermentation. I apply it in the latter sense and shall use it as describing grape juice which has been spontaneously and recently fermented without the addition of any foreign materials or altered by keeping. Or heating, or any other process beyond fermentation. All such processes and admixture which affect any chemical changes on the raw material I shall describe as cookery and the result as cooked wine. When I refer to wine made from other juice than that of the grape, it will be named specifically. At the outset, a fallacy, very prevalent in this country, should be controverted. The high prices charged for the cooked material sold to Englishmen has led to absurdly exaggerated notions of the original value of wine. I am quite safe in stating that the average market value of rich wine in its raw state, in countries where the grape grows luxuriantly, and where, in consequence, the average quality of the wine is the best, does not exceed sixpence per gallon or one penny per bottle. I speak now of the newly made wine. Allowing another sixpence per gallon for barreling and storage, the value of the commodity in portable form becomes two pence per bottle. I am not speaking of thin, poor wines produced by a second or third pressing of the grapes, but of the best and richest quality. And, of course, I do not include the fancy wines, those produced in certain vineyards of celebrated chateaux, that are superstitiously venerated by those easily deluded people who suppose themselves to be connoisseurs of choice wines. I refer to 99% of the rich wines that actually come into the market. Wines made from grapes grown in unfavorable climates naturally cost more in proportion to the poorness of the yield. As some of my readers may be inclined to question this estimate of average cost, a few illustrative facts may be named. In Sicily and Calabria are usually paid at the roadside or village osterias an equivalent of one half penny for a glass or a tumbler holding nearly half a pint of common wine, thin but genuine. This was at the rate of less than one shilling per gallon or two pence per bottle and included the cost of barreling, storage and innkeeper's profit on retailing. 
In the luxuriant wine-growing regions of Spain, a traveller halting at a railway refreshment station and buying one of the sausage sandwiches that there prevail is allowed to help himself to wine to drink on the spot without charge, but if he feels his flask to carry away, he is subjected to an extra charge of one half penny. It is well known to all concerned that at vintage time of fairly good seasons, in all countries where the grape grows freely, a good empty cask is worth more than the new wine it contains when filled, that much wine is wasted from lack of vessels, and anybody sending two good empty casks to a vigneron can have one of them filled in exchange for the other. Those who desire further illustrations and verification should ask their friends, outside of the trade, who have travelled in southern wine countries and know the language and something more of the country than is to be learned by being simply transferred from one hotel to another under the guidance of couriers, chicharoni, valet de place, etc. Thus, the five shillings paid for a bottle of rich port is made up of one penny for the original wine, one penny more for cost of storage, etc., about sixpence for duty and carriage to this country, and two pence for bottling, making ten pence altogether. The remaining four shillings and two pence is paid for cookery and wine merchants' profits. Under cookery, I include those changes which may be obtained by simply exposing the wine to the action of the temperature of an ordinary cellar, or the higher temperature of pasturing, to be presently described. In the youthful days of chemistry, the first of these methods of cookery was the only one available, and wine was kept by wine merchants with purely commercial intent for a considerable number of years. A little reflection will show that this simple and original cookery was very expensive, sufficiently so to legitimately explain the rise in market value from ten pence to five shillings or more per bottle. Wine merchants require a respectable profit on the capital they invest in their business, at least 10% per annum on the prime cost of the wine laid down. Then there is the rental of cellars and offices, the establishment expenses, such as wages, sampling, sending out, advertising, losses by bad debts, etc., to be added. The capital lying dead in the cellar demands compound interest. At 10%, the principal doubles in about seven and one-third years. Calling it seven years, to allow very meagerly for establishment expenses, we get the following result. When seven years old, the ten-penny wine is worth one shilling eight pence per bottle. When fourteen years old, the ten-penny wine is worth three shillings four pence per bottle. When twenty-one years old, the ten-penny wine is worth six shilling eight pence per bottle. When twenty-eight years old, the ten-penny wine is worth thirteen shillings four pence per bottle. When thirty-five years old, the ten-penny wine is worth one pound six shillings eight pence per bottle. Here, then, we have a fair commercial explanation of the high prices of old-fashioned old wines, or of what I may now call the traditional value of wine. Of course, this is less when a man lays down his own wine in his own cellar, in obedience to the maxim, lay down good port in the days of your youth, and when you are old your friends will not forsake you. He may be satisfied with a much smaller rate of interest than the man engaged in business fairly demands. Still, when wine thus aged was thrown into the market, it competed with commercially cellared wine and obtained remarkable prices, especially as it has a special value for blending purposes, that is, for mixing with newer wines and infecting them with its own senility. But why do I say that now such values are traditional? Simply because the progress of chemistry has shown us how the changes resulting from years of cellarage may be affected by scientific cookery in a few hours or days. We are indebted to Pasteur for the most legitimate, I might say the only legitimate, method of doing this. The process is accordingly called pasturing. It consists in simply heating the wine to the temperature of 60 degrees Celsius, 140 degrees Fahrenheit, 
the temperature at which, as will be remembered, the visible changes in the cookery of animal food commences. It is worthy of note that this is also the exact temperature at which diastase acts most powerfully in converting starch into dextrin. Pasturing is a process demanding considerable skill. No portion of the wine during its cookery must be raised above 140 degrees, yet all must reach it, nor must it be exposed to the air. The apparatus designed by Rossignol is one of the best suited for this purpose. It is a large metallic vat or boiler with airtight cover and a false bottom, from which rises a trumpet-shaped tube through the middle of the vat and passing through an airtight fitting in the cover. The chamber formed by the false bottom is filled with water by means of this tube, the object being to prevent the wine at the lower part from being heated directly by the fire which is below the water chamber. A thermometer is also inserted airtight in the lid, with its bulb halfway down the vat. To allow for expansion, a tube is similarly fitted into the lid. This is bent siphon-like, and its lower end dipped into a flask containing wine or water, so that air or vapour may escape and bubble through, but none enter. Even in drawing off from the vat, the wine is not allowed to flow through the air, but is conveyed by a pipe which bends down and dips to the bottom of the barrel. The apparatus is bulky and expensive. If heated with exposure to air, the wine acquires a flavour easily recognised as the goût de cuit, or flavour of cooking. When Pasteur's method is properly conducted, the only changes affected are those which would be otherwise produced by age. I have heard of many failures made by English wine merchants in their attempts at pasturing, and I am not at all surprised, seeing how secretly and clumsily these attempts have been made. The changes thus produced are somewhat obscure. One effect is probably that which more decidedly occurs in the maturing of whiskey and other spirits distilled from grain, that is, the reduction of the proportion of amylic alcohol or fusel oil, which, although less abundantly produced in the fermentation of grape juice than in grain or potato spirit, is formed in varying quantities. Caproic alcohol and caprylic alcohol are also produced by the fermentation of grape juice or the mark of grapes, that is, the mixture of the whole juice and the skins. These are acrid, ill-flavoured spirits, more conducive to headache than the ethylic alcohol, which is proper spirit of good wine. Every wine drinker knows that the amount of headache obtainable from a given quantity of wine or a given outlay of cash varies with the sample, and this variation appears to be due to these supplementary alcohols or ethers. Another change appears to be the formation of ethers having choice flavours and bouquets, or enanthic ether, or the ether of wine, is the most important of these, and it is probably formed by the action of the natural acid salts of the wine upon its alcohol. Johnston says, so powerful is the odour of this substance, however, that few wines contain more than one forty thousandth part of their bulk of it. Yet it is always present, can always be recognised by its smell, and is one of the general characteristics of all grape wines. This ether is stated to be the basis of Hungarian wine oil, which, according to the same authority, has been sold for flavouring brandy at the rate of sixty-nine dollars per pound. I am surprised that up to the present time it has not been cheaply produced in large quantities. Chemical problems that appear far more difficult have been practically solved. The paternal tenderness with which wine is regarded, both by its producers and consumers, is amusing. They speak of it as being sick, describe its diseases and their remedies as though it were a sentient being and these diseases, like our own, are now attributed to bacilli, bacteria, or other microbia. Pasteur, who has worked out this question of the origin of diseases in wine, as he is so well known to have done in animals, recommends, in papers read before the French Academy in May and August 1865, 
that these microbia be killed by filling the bottles close up to the cork which is thrust in just with sufficient firmness to allow the wine on expanding to force it out a little but not entirely thus preventing any air from entering the bottle the bottles are then placed in a chamber heated to temperatures ranging from 45 degrees to 100 degrees centigrade 113 degrees to 212 degrees fahrenheit where they remain for an hour or two they are then set aside allowed to cool and the cork driven in it is said that this treatment kills the microbia gives to the wine an increased bouquet and improved color in fact ages it considerably both old and new wines may be thus treated i simply state this on the authority of pasteur having made no direct experiments or observations on these diseases which he describes as resulting in acidification ropiness bitterness and decay or decomposition there is however another kind of sickness which i have studied both experimentally and theoretically i refer to the temporary sickness which sometimes occurs to rich wines when they are moved from one cellar to another and to light wines when newly exported from their native climate to our own genuine wines are the most subject to such sickness the natural unsophisticated wines those that have not been subjected to fortification to vinage to plastering sulphuring etc processes of cookery to be presently described this sickness shows itself by the wine becoming turbid or opalescent then throwing down either a crust or a loose troublesome sediment those of my readers who are sufficiently interested in this subject to care to study it practically should make the following experiment dissolve in distilled water or better in water slightly acidulated with hydrochloric acid as much cream of tartar as will saturate it this is best done by heating the water agitating an excess of cream of tartar in it then allowing the water to cool the excess of salt to subside and pouring off the clear solution now add to this solution while quite clear and bright a little clear brandy whiskey or other spirit and mix them by shaking the solution will become sick like the wine why is this it depends upon the fact that the biartrate of potash or cream of tartar is soluble to some extent in water but almost insoluble in alcohol in a mixture of alcohol and water its solubility is intermediate the more alcohol the smaller the quantity that can be held in solution hydrochloric and most other acids excepting tartaric increase its solubility in water thus if we have a saturated solution of this salt either in pure water or acidulated water or wine the addition of alcohol throws some of it down in solid form and this makes the solution sick or turbid when pure water or acidulated water is used as in the above described experiment crystals of the salt are freely formed and fall down readily but with a complex liquid like wine containing saccharine and mucilaginous matter the precipitation takes place very slowly the particles are excessively minute become entangled with the mucilage etc and thus remain suspended for a long time maintaining the turbidity accordingly now this bitartrate of potash is the characteristic natural salt of the grape and its unfermented juice is saturated with it as fermentation proceeds and the sugar of the grape juice is converted into alcohol the capacity of the juice for holding the salt in solution diminishes and it is gradually thrown down but it does not fall alone it carries with it some of the coloring and extractive matter of the grape juice this precipitate in its crude state called argol or roher weinstein is the source from which we obtain the tartaric acid of commerce the cream of tartar and other salts of tartaric acid now let us suppose that we have a natural unsophisticated wine it is evident that it is saturated with the tartrate since only so much argol was thrown down during fermentation as it was unable to retain 
it is further evident that if such a wine has not been exhaustively fermented that is if it still contains some of the original grape sugar and if any further fermentation of this sugar takes place the capacity of the mixture for holding the tartrate in solution becomes diminished and the further precipitation must occur this precipitation will come down very slowly will consist not merely of pure crystals of cream of tartar but of minute particles carrying with it some colouring matter extractives etc and thus spoiling the brilliancy of the wine making it more or less turbid but this is not all boiling water dissolves one-sixth of its weight of cream of tartar cold water only one hundred eightieth and at intermediate temperatures intermediate quantities therefore if we lower the temperature of a saturated solution precipitation occurs hence the sickening of wine due to change of cellars or change of climate even when no further fermentation occurs the lighter the wine that is the less alcohol it contains naturally the more tartrate it contains and the greater the liability to this source of sickness this then is the temporary sickness to which i have referred i have proved the truth of this theory by filtering such sickened wine through laboratory filtering paper thereby rendering it transparent and obtaining on the paper all the guilty disturbing matter i found it to be a kind of argol but containing a much larger proportion of extractive and colouring matter and a smaller proportion of tartrate than the argol of commerce i operated upon rich new catalan wine this brings me at once to the source or origin of a sort of wine cookery by no means so legitimate as the pasturing already described as it frequently amounts to serious adulteration the wine merchants are here the victims of their customers who demand an amount of transparency that is simply impossible as a permanent condition of unsophisticated grape wine to anybody who has any knowledge of the chemistry of wine nothing can be more ludicrous than the antics of the pretending connoisseur of wine who holds his glass up to the light shuts one eye even at the stage before double vision commences and admires the brilliancy of the liquid this very brilliancy being in nineteen samples out of twenty the evidence of adulteration cookery or sophistication of some kind genuine wine made from pure grape juice without chemical manipulation is a liquid that is never reliably clear for the reasons above stated partial precipitation sufficient to produce opalescence is continually taking place and therefore the unnatural brilliancy demanded is obtained by substituting the natural and wholesome tartrate by salts of mineral acids and even by the free mineral acid itself at one time i deemed this latter adulteration impossible but have been convinced by direct examination of samples of high priced mark this not cheap dry sherries that they contained free sulphuric and sulphurous acid the action of this free mineral acid on the wine will be understood by what i have already explained concerning the solubility of the bitartrate of potash the solubility is greatly increased by a little of such acid and therefore the transparency of the wine is by such addition rendered stable unaffected by changes of temperature but what is the effect of such free mineral acid on the drinker of the wine if he is in any degree predisposed to gout rheumatism stone or any of the lithic acid diseases his life is sacrificed with preceding tortures of the most horrible kind it has been stated and probably with truth that the late emperor napoleon the third drank dry sherry and was a martyr of this kind i repeat emphatically that generally speaking high-priced dry sherries are far worse than cheap marsala both as regards the quantity they contain of sulphates and free acid anybody who doubts this may convince himself by simply purchasing a little chloride of barium dissolving it in distilled water and adding to the sample of wine to be tested a few drops of this solution pure wine containing its full supply of natural tartrate 
will become cloudy to a small extent and gradually a small precipitate will be formed by the tartrate the wine that contains either free sulphuric acid or any of its compounds will lead immediately a copious white precipitate like chalk but much more dense this is sulphate of barita the experiment may be made in a common wine glass but better in a cylindrical test tube as by using in this a fixed quantity in each experiment a rough notion of the relative quantity of sulphate may be formed by the depth of the white layer after all has come down to determine this accurately the wine after applying the test should be filtered through proper filtering paper and the precipitate and paper burned in a platinum or porcelain crucible and then weighed but this demands apparatus not always available and some technical skill the simple demonstration of the copious precipitation is instructive and those of my readers who are practical chemists but have not yet applied this test to such wines will be astonished as i was at the amount of precipitation i may add that my first experience was upon a sample of dry sherry brought to me by a friend who bought his wine of a respectable wine merchant and paid a high price for it but found that it disagreed with him it contained an alarming quantity of free sulphuric acid since that i have tested scores of samples some of the finest in the market sent to me by a conscientious importer as the best he could obtain and these contain sulphate of potash instead of bitartrate my friend the sherry merchant could not account for it though he was most anxious to do so this was about three years ago by dint of inquiry and cross-examination of experts in the wine trade i have i believe discovered the origin of the sulphate of potash that is contained in the samples that the british wine merchant sells as he buys and conscientiously believes to be pure at first i hunted up all the information i could obtain from books concerning the manufacture of sherry learned that the grapes are usually sprinkled with a little powdered sulphur as they are placed in the vats prior to stamping the quantity thus added however is quite insufficient to account for the sulphur compounds in the samples of wine i examined another source is described in the books that from sulphuring the casks this process consists simply of burning sulphur inside a partially filled or empty cask until the exhaustion of free oxygen and its replacement by sulphurous acid renders further combustion impossible the cask is then filled with the wine this would add a little of sulphurous acid but still not sufficient then comes the plastering or intentional addition of gypsum plaster of paris this if largely carried out is sufficient to explain the complete conversion of the natural tartrates into sulphates of potash and such plastering is admitted to be an adulteration or sophistication i obtain samples of sherry from a reliable source which i have no doubt the shipper honestly believed to have been subjected to no such deliberate plastering still from these came down an extravagantly excessive precipitate on the addition of chloride of barium solution i afterwards learned that spanish earth was used in the fining why spanish earth in preference to isinglass or white of egg which are quite unobjectionable and very efficient to this question i could get no satisfactory answer directly but learned vaguely that the fining produced by the white of egg though complete at the time was not permanent while that effected by spanish earth containing much sulphate of lime is permanent the brilliancy thus obtained is not lost by age or variations of temperature and the dry sherries thus cooked are preferred by english wine drinkers the sulphate of potash which by the action of sulphate of lime is made to replate by tartrate is so readily soluble that neither changes of temperature nor increase of alcohol due to further fermentation will throw it down and thus the winemaker and wine merchant without any guilty intent and ignorant of what he is really doing sophisticates the wine alters its essential composition 
and adds an impurity in doing what he supposes to be a mere clarification or removal of impurities. I have heard of genuine sherries being returned as bad to the shipper because they were genuine and had been fined without sophistication. My own experience of genuine wines in wine-growing countries teaches me that such wines are rarely brilliant, and the variations of solubility of the natural salt of the grape, which I have already explained, shows why this is the case. If the drinkers of sherry and other white and golden wines would cease to demand the conventional brilliancy, they would soon be supplied with the genuine article, which really costs the wine merchant less than the cooked product they now insist upon having. This foolish demand of his customers merely gives him a large amount of unnecessary trouble and annoyance. So far the wine merchant. But how about the customer? Simply that the substitution of a mineral acid, the sulphuric for a vegetable acid, the tartaric, supplies him with a precipitant of lithic acid in his own body, that is, provides him with the source of gout, rheumatism, gravel, stone, etc., with which English wine-drinkers are proverbially tortured. I am the more urgent in propounding this view of the subject, because I see plainly that not only the patients, but too commonly their medical advisers, do not understand it. When I was in the midst of these experiments, I called upon a clerical neighbor and found him in his study with his foot on a pillow and groaning with gout. A decanter of pale, choice, very dry sherry was on the table. He poured out a glass for me and another for himself. I tasted it, and then perpetrated the unheard-of rudeness of denouncing the wine for which my host had paid so high a price. He knew a little chemistry, and I accordingly went home forthwith, brought back some chloride of barium, added it to his choice sherry, and showed him a precipitate which made him shudder. He drank no more dry sherry, and has had no serious relapse of gout. In this case, his medical adviser prohibited port and advised dry sherry. End of section 17 Section 18 of The Chemistry of Cookery This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avahi in July 2020. The Chemistry of Cookery by W. Mathieu Williams. The Cookery of Wine, Part 2. The following from The Brewer, Distiller, and Wine Manufacturer by John Gardner, Churchill's Technological Handbooks, 1883, supports my view of the position of the winemaker and wine merchant. Dupré and Thudicum have shown by experiment that this practice of plastering, as it is called, also reduces the yield of the liquid, as a considerable part of the wine mechanically combines with the gypsum and is lost. When an adulteration, justly so called, is practiced, the object is to enable the perpetrator to obtain an increased profit on selling the commodity at a given price. In this case, an opposite result is obtained. The gypsum, or a Spanish earth, is used in considerable quantity, and leaves a bulky residuum which carries away some of the wine with it, and thus increases the cost to the seller of the saleable result. Having referred so often to dry wines, I should explain the chemistry of this so-called dryness. The fermentation of wine is the result of a vegetable growth, that of the yeast, a microscopic fungus, Penicillium glaucum. The must or juice of the grape obtains the germ spontaneously, probably from the atmosphere. Two distinct effects are produced by this fermentation or growth of fungus. First, the sugar of the must is converted into alcohol. Second, more or less of the albuminous or nitrogenous matter of the must is consumed as food by the fungus. If uninterrupted, this fermentation goes on either until the supply of sufficient sugar is stopped or until the supply of sufficient albuminous matter is stopped. 
the relative proportions of these determine which of the two shall be first exhausted. If the sugar is exhausted before the nitrogenous food of the fungus, a dry wine is produced. If the nitrogenous food is first consumed, the remaining unfermented sugar produces a sweet wine. If the sugar is greatly in excess, a vin de liqueur is the result, such as the frontignac, lunel, rive salts, etc., made from the muscat grape. The varieties of grape are very numerous. Rusby, in his Visit to the Vineyards of Spain and France, gives a list of 507 varieties, and, as far back as 1827, Cavallo enumerated more than 1,500 different wines in France alone. From the above it will be understood that, caeteris paribus, the poorer the grape, the drier the wine, or that a given variety of grape will yield a drier wine if grown where it ripens imperfectly than if grown in a warmer climate. But the quantity of wine obtainable from a given acreage in the cooler climate is less than where the sun is more effective, and thus the naturally dry wines cost more to produce than the naturally sweet wines. The reader will understand, from what has already been stated concerning the origin of the difference between natural sweet wines and natural dry wines, that the conversion of either one into the other is not a difficult problem. Wine is a fashionable beverage in this country, and fashions fluctuate. These fluctuations are not accompanied with a corresponding variation in the chemical composition of any particular class of grapes, but somehow the wine produced therefrom obeys the laws of supply and demand. For some years past, the demand for dry sherry has dominated in this country, though, as I am informed, the weathercock of fashion is now on the turn. One mode of satisfying this demand for dry wine is, of course, to make it from a grape which has little sugar and much albuminous matter, but in a given district this is not always possible. Another is to gather the grapes before they are fully ripened, but this involves a sacrifice in the yield of alcohol and probably of flavour. Another method, obvious enough to the chemist, is to add as much albuminous or nitrogenous material as shall continue to feed the yeast fungus until all, or nearly all, the sugar in the grape shall be converted into alcohol, thus supplying strength and dryness, or salinity, simultaneously. Should these be excessive, the remedy is simple and cheap wherever water abounds. It should be noted that the quantity of sugar naturally contained in the ripe grape varies from 10 to 30%, a very large range. The quantity of alcohol varies proportionally when the must is fermented to dryness. According to Pavey, there are dry cherries to be met with that are free from sugar, while in other wines the quantity of remaining sugar amounts to as much as 20%. White of egg and gelatin are the most easily available and innocent forms of nitrogenous material that may be used for sustaining or renewing the fermentation of wines that are to be artificially dried. My inquiries in the trade lead me to conclude that this is not understood as well as it should be. Both white of egg and gelatin, in the form of isinglass or otherwise, are freely used for fining, and it is well enough known that wines that have been freely subjected to such fining keep better and become drier with age, but I have never yet met a wine merchant who understood why, nor any sound explanation of the fact in the trade literature. When thus added to the wine already fermented, the effect is doubtless due to the promotion of a slow, secondary fermentation. The bulk of the gelatin or albumen is carried down with the sediment, but some remains in solution. There may be some doubt as to the albumen thus remaining, but none concerning the gelatin, which is freely soluble both in water and alcohol. The truly scientific mode of applying this principle would be to add the nitrogenous material to the must. I dwell thus upon this because, if fashion insists so imperatively upon dryness as to compel artificial drying, 
this method is the least objectionable, being a close imitation of natural drying, almost identical, while there are other methods of inducing fictitious dryness that are mischievous adulterations. Generally described, these consist in producing an imitation of the natural salinity of the dry wine by the addition of factitious salts and fortifying with alcohol. The sugar remains, but is disguised thereby. It was a wine thus treated that first brought the subject of the sulfates, already referred to, under my notice. It contained a considerable quantity of sugar, but was not perceptibly sweet. It was very strong and decidedly acid, contained free sulphuric acid and alum, which, as all who have tasted it know, gives a peculiar sense of dryness to the palate. The sulphuring, plastering and use of Spanish earth increased the dryness of a given wine by adding mineral acid and mineral salts. In a paper recently read before the French Academy by El Manier de la Source, Compte Rendu, volume 98, page 110, the author states that plastering modifies the chemical characters of the coloring matter of the wine, and not only does the calcium sulfate decompose the potassium hydrogen tartrate, cream of tartar, with formation of calcium tartrate, potassium sulphate and free tartaric acid, but it also decomposes the neutral organic compounds of potassium which exist in the juice of the grape. I quote from abstract in Journal of the Chemical Society of May 1884. In the French Journal of Pharmaceutical Chemistry, volume 6, pages 118 to 123, 1882, is a paper by P. Karl, in which the chemical and hygienic results of plastering are discussed. His general conclusion is that the use of gypsum in clearing wines renders them hurtful as beverages, that the gypsum acts on the potassium bitartrate in the juice of the grape, forming calcium tartrate, tartaric acid, and potassium sulfate, a large proportion of the last two bodies remaining in the wine. Unplastered wines contain about 2 grams of free acid per liter. After plastering, they contain double or treble that amount, and even more. A German chemist, Griesmeier, and more recently another, Kaiser, have also studied this subject and arrive at similar conclusions. Kaiser analyzed wines which were plastered by adding gypsum to the must, that is, to the juice before fermentation, and also samples in which the gypsum was added to the finished wine, that is, for fining, so called. He found that in the finished wine, by the addition of gypsum, the tartaric acid is replaced by sulphuric acid, and there is a perceptible increase in the calcium. The other constituents remain unaltered. His conclusion is that the plastering of wine should be called adulteration and treated accordingly, on the ground that the article in question is thereby deprived of its characteristic constituents, and others, not normally present, are introduced. This refers more especially to the plastering or gypsum fining of finished wines. Biedermann's Zentralblatt, 1881, pages 632, 633. In the paper above named by P. Karl, we are told that, owing to the injurious nature of the impurities of plastered wines, endeavors have been made to free them from these by a method called deplastering, but the remedy proves worse than the defect. The samples analyzed by Karl contained barium salts, barium chloride having been used to remove the sulphuric acid. In some cases, excess of the barium salt was found in the wine, and in others, barium sulphate was held in suspension. Closely following the abstract of this paper, in the Journal of the Chemical Society, is another from the French Journal of Pharmaceutical Chemistry, Volume 5, pages 581 to 3, to which I now refer, by the way, for the instruction of claret drinkers, who may not be aware of the fact that the phylloxera destroyed all the claret grapes in certain districts of France, 
without stopping the manufacture or diminishing the export of claret itself. In this paper, by J. Lefort, we are told, as a matter of course, that, owing to the ravages of the phylloxera among the vines, substitutes for grape juice are being introduced for the manufacture of wines. Of these, the author specially condemns the use of beetroot sugar, since, during its fermentation, besides ethyl alcohol and aldehyde, it yields propyl, butyl, and amyl alcohols, which have been shown by Dujardin and Odiger to act as poisons in very small quantities. In connection with this subject, I may add that the French government carefully protects its own citizens by rigid inspection and analysis of the wines offered for sale to French wine drinkers, but does not feel bound to expend its funds and energies in hampering commerce by severe examination of the wines that are exported to John Bull et Son Ile, especially as John Bull is known to have a robust constitution. Thus, vast quantities of brilliantly colored liquid, flavored with orris root, which would not be allowed to pass the barriers of Paris, but must go somewhere, is drunk in England at a cost of four times as much as the Frenchman pays for genuine grape wine. The colored concoction being brighter, skillfully cooked and duly labeled to imitate the products of real or imaginary celebrated vineyards, is preferred by the English gourmet to anything that can be made from simple grape juice. I should add that a character somewhat similar to that of natural dryness is obtained by mixing with the grape juice wine a secondary product, obtained by adding water to the mar, that is, the residue of skins, etc., that remains after pressing out the must or juice. A minimum of sugar is dissolved in the water, and this liquor is fermented. The skins and seeds contain much tannic acid or astringent matter, and this roughness imposes upon many wine drinkers, provided the price charged for the wine thus cheapened be sufficiently high. Some years ago, while resident in Birmingham, an enterprising manufacturing druggist consulted me on a practical difficulty which he was unable to solve. He had succeeded in producing a very fine claret, Chateau d'Igbert, let us call it, by duly fortifying with silent spirit a solution of cream of tartar and flavoring this with a small quantity of orris root. Tasted in the dark, it was all that could be desired for introducing a new industry to Birmingham, but the wine was white, and every coloring material that he had tried, producing the required tint, marred the flavor and bouquet of the pure Chateau d'Igbeth. He might have used one of the magenta dyes, but that these were prepared by boiling aniline over dry arsenic acid, and my Birmingham friend was burdened with a conscience, he refrained from thus applying one of the recent triumphs of chemical science. This was previous to the invasion of France by the phylloxera. During the early period of that visitation, French enterprise being more powerfully stimulated and less scrupulous than that of Birmingham, made use of the aniline dyes for colouring spurious claret to such an extent that the French government interfered, and a special test paper named Eunocrine was invented by Monsieur Lanville and Roy, and sold in Paris for the purpose of detecting falsely coloured wines. The mode of using the Eunocrine is as follows. A slip of the paper is steeped in pure wine for about five seconds, briskly shaken in order to remove excess of liquid, and then placed on a sheet of white paper to serve as a standard. A second slip of the test paper is then steeped in the suspected wine in the same manner and laid beside the former. It is asserted that one one hundred thousandth of magenta is sufficient to give the paper a violet shade, whilst the larger quantity produces a carmine red. With genuine red wine, the color produced is a grayish blue, which becomes lead colored on drying. I copy the above from the Quarterly Journal of Science of April 1877. The editor adds that the inventors of this paper have discovered a method of removing the magenta from wines without injuring their quality, 
a fact of some importance if it be true that several hundred thousand hectolitres of wine sophisticated with magenta are in the hands of wine merchants a hectolitre is equal to twenty-two gallons another simple test that was recommended at the time was to immerse a small wisp of raw silk in the suspected wine keeping it there at a boiling heat for a few minutes aniline colors dye the silk permanently the natural color of the grape is easily washed out i find on referring to the chemical news the journal of the chemical society the compte rendu and other scientific periodicals of the period of the phylloxera plague such a multitude of methods for testing false coloring material that i give up in despair my original intention of describing them in detail it would demand far more space than the subject deserves i will however just name a few of the more harmless coloring adulterants that are stated to have been used and for which special tests have been devised by french and german chemists beetroot peachwood elderberries mulberries logwood privet berries litmus ammoniacal cochineal ferambuca wood phytolacca burnt sugar extract of ratany bilberries jerupiga or geropiga a compound of elder juice brown sugar grape juice and crude portuguese brandy for choice tawny port tincture of saffron turmeric or safflower for golden sherry red poppies mellow flowers etc those of my readers who have done anything in practical chemistry are well acquainted with blue and red litmus and the general fact that such vegetable colors change from blue to red when exposed to an acid and return to blue when the acid is overcome by an alkali the coloring matter of the grape is one of these mulder and Momenet have given it the name of oenocyan or wine blue as its color when neutral is blue the red color of genuine wines is due to the presence of tartaric and acetic acid acting upon the wine blue there are a few purple wines their color being due to unusual absence of acid the original vintage which gave celebrity to port wine is an example of this the bouquet of wine is usually described as due to the presence of ether onantic ether which is naturally formed during the fermentation of grape juice and is itself a variable mixture of other ethers such as caprylic caproic etc the oil of the seed of the grape contributes to the bouquet the fancy values of fancy wines are largely due or more properly speaking were largely due to peculiarities of bouquet these peculiar wines became costly because their supply was limited only a certain vineyard in some cases of very small area producing the whole crop of the fancy article the high price once established and the demand far exceeding the possibilities of supply from the original source other and resembling wines are now sold under the name of the celebrated locality with the bouquet or a bouquet artificially introduced it has thus come about in the ordinary course of business that the dearest wines of the choicest brands are those which are the most likely to be sophisticated the flavoring of wine the imparting of delicate bouquet is a high art and is costly it is only upon high-priced wines that such costly operations can be practiced simple ordinary grape juice as i have already stated is so cheap when and where its quality is the highest that is in good seasons and suitable climates that adulteration with anything but water renders the adulterated product more costly than the genuine when there is a good vintage it does not pay even to add sugar and water to the mar or residue and press this a second time it is more profitable to use it for making inferior brandy or wine oil huile de mar or even for fodder or manure this however only applies where the demand is for simple genuine wine a demand almost unknown in england where connoisseurs abound who pass their glasses horizontally under their noses hold them up to the light to look for bee swings and absurd transparency knowingly examine the brand on the cork 
and otherwise offer themselves as willing dupes to be pecuniarily immolated on the great high altar of the holy shrine of costly humbug some years ago i was at frankfort on my way to the tyrol and venice and there saw a few paces before me an unquestionable englishman with an ill-slung knapsack i spoke to him earned his gratitude at once by showing him how to dispense with that knapsack abomination the breast strap we chummed and put up at a genuine german hostelry of my selection the gasthaus zum schwanen here we supped with a multitude of natives to the great amusement of my new friend who had hitherto halted at hotels devised for englishmen the handmaiden served us with wine in tumblers and we both pronounced it excellent my new friend was enthusiastic the bouquet was superior to anything he had ever met with before and if it could only be fined it was not by any means bright it would be invaluable he then took me into his confidence he was in the wine trade assisting in his father's business the governor had told him to look out in the course of his travels as there were obscure vineyards here and there producing very choice wines that might be contracted for at very low prices this was one of them here was good business if i would help him to learn all about it presentation cases of wine should be poured upon me for ever after i accordingly asked the handmaiden was für wein etc her answer was Apfelwein. She was frightened at my burst of laughter, and the young wine merchant also imagined that he had made acquaintance with a lunatic, until I translated the answer and told him that we had been drinking cider. We called for more, and then recognized the curious bouquet at once. The manufacture of bouquets has made great progress of late, and they are much cheaper than formerly their chief source is coal tar the refuse from gas works that most easily produced is the essence of bitter almonds which supplies a nutty flavor and bouquet anybody may make it by simply adding benzol the most volatile portion of the coal tar in small portions at a time to warm fuming nitric acid on cooling and diluting the mixture a yellow oil which solidifies at a little above the freezing point of water is formed it may be purified by washing first with water and then with a weak solution of carbonate of soda to remove the excess of acid it is now largely used in cookery as essence of bitter almonds its old perfumery name was essence of myrbane by more elaborate operations on the coal tar product a number of other essences and bouquets of curiously imitative character are produced one of the most familiar of these is the essence of jargonelle pears which flavors the pear drops of the confectioner so cunningly another is raspberry flavor by the aid of which a mixture of fig seeds and apple pulp duly colored may be converted into a raspberry jam that would deceive our prime minister i do not say that it now it is so used though i believe it has been for the simple reason that wholesale jam makers now grow their own fruit so cheaply that the genuine article costs no more than the sham raspberries can be grown and gathered at a cost of about two pence per pound with wine at sixty shillings to one hundred shillings per dozen the case is different the price leaves an ample margin for the conversion of italian reds catalans and other sound ordinary wines into any fancy brands that may happen to be in fashion such being the case the mere fact that certain emperors or potentates have bought up the whole produce of the chateau that is named on the labels does not interfere with the market supply which is strictly regulated by the demand visiting a friend in the trade he offered me a glass of wine that he drank himself when at home and supplied to his own family he asked my opinion of it i replied that i thought it was genuine grape juice resembling that which i had been accustomed to drink at country inns in the Côte d'Or, burgundy and in italy he told me that he imported it directly from a district near to that i first named and could supply it at twelve shillings per dozen with a fair profit 
Afterwards, when calling at his place of business in the West End, he told me that one of his best customers had just been tasting the various samples of dinner claret then remaining on the table, some of them expensive, and that he had chosen the same as I had. But what was my friend to do? Had he quoted twelve shillings per dozen, he would have lost one of his best customers, and sacrificed his reputation as a high-class wine merchant. Therefore he quoted fifty-four shillings, and both buyer and seller were perfectly satisfied. The wine merchant made a large profit, and the customer obtained what he demanded, a good wine at a respectable price. He could not insult his friends by putting cheap twelve-shilling trash on his table. Here arises an ethical question. Was the wine merchant justified in making this charge under the circumstances, or otherwise stated, who was to blame for the crookedness of the transaction? I say the customer. My verdict is, sarf him right. In reference to wines, and still more to cigars, and some other useless luxuries, the typical Englishman is a victim to a prevalent commercial superstition. He blindly assumes that price must necessarily represent quality, and therefore shuts his eyes and opens his mouth to swallow anything with complete satisfaction, provided that he pays a good price for it at a respectable establishment, that is, one where only high-priced articles are sold. If any reader thinks I speak too strongly, let him ascertain the market price per pound of the best Havana tobacco leaves where they are grown, also the cost of twisting them into cigar shape, a skilful workwoman can make a thousand in a day, then add to the sum of these the cost of packing, carriage, and duty. He will be rather astonished at the result of this arithmetical problem. If these things were necessities of life, or contributed in any degree or manner to human welfare, I should protest indignantly. But seeing what they are and what they do, I rather rejoice at the limitation of consumption effected by their fancy prices. End of section 18。section 19 of the chemistry of cookery。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Chemistry of Cookery by W. Matthew Williams. Chapter 19 The Vegetarian Question. In my introductory chapter, I said the fact that we use the digestive and nutrient apparatus of sheep, oxen, etc., for the preparation of our food is merely a transitory barbarism to be ultimately superseded when my present subject is sufficiently understood and applied to enable us to prepare the constituents of the vegetable kingdom to be as easily assimilated as the prepared grass which we call beef and mutton this sentence when it appeared in knowledge brought me in communication with a very earnest body of men and women who at considerable social inconvenience are abstaining from flesh food and doing it purely on principle some people sneer at them call them crotchety fatty etc but for my part i have a great respect for crotchety people having learned long ago that every first great step that has ever been taken in the path of human progress was denounced as a crotchet by those it was leaving behind this respect is quite apart from the consideration of whether i agree or disagree with the crotchets themselves i therefore willingly respond to the request that i should explain more fully my view on this subject the fact that there are now in London eight exclusively vegetarian restaurants, and all of them flourishing, shows that it is one of wide interest. At the outset, it is necessary to brush aside certain false issues that are commonly raised in discussing this subject. The question is not whether we are herbivorous or carnivorous animals. It is perfectly certain that we are neither. The carnivora feed on flesh alone and eat that flesh raw. Nobody proposes that we should do this the herbivora eat raw grass nobody suggests that we should follow their example it is perfectly clear that man cannot be classed with the carnivorous animals nor the herbivorous animals nor with the graminivorous animals his teeth are not constructed for munching and grinding raw grain nor his digestive organs for assimilating such grain in this condition he is not even to be classed with the omnivorous animals 
he stands apart from all as the cooking animal it is true that there was a time when our ancestors ate raw flesh including that of each other in the limestone caverns of this and other european countries we find human bones gnawed by human teeth and split open by flint implements for the evident purpose of extracting the marrow according to the domestic economy of the period the shell mounds that these prehistoric bipeds have left behind show that mussels oysters and other mollusca were also eaten raw and they doubtless varied the menu with snails slugs and worms as the remaining australian savages still do besides these they probably included roots succulent plants nuts and such fruit as then existed there are many among us who are very proud of their ancient lineage and who think it honourable to go back as far as possible and to maintain the customs of their forefathers but they all seem to draw a line somewhere none desiring to go as far back as their interglacial troglodytic ancestors and therefore i need not discuss the desirability of restoring their dietary all human beings became cooks as soon as they learned how to make fire and have all continued to be cooks ever since we should therefore look at this vegetarian question from the point of view of prepared food which excludes nearly all comparison with the food of the brute creation i say nearly all because there is one case in which all the animals that approach the nearest to ourselves the mammalia are provided naturally with a special prepared food viz the mother's milk the composition of this preparation appears to me to throw more light than anything else upon this vegetarian controversy and yet it seems to have been entirely overlooked the milk prepared for the young of the different animals in the laboratory or kitchen of nature is surely adapted to their structure as regards natural food requirements without assuming that the human dietetic requirements are identical with either of the other mammals we may learn something concerning our approximation to one class or another by comparing the composition of human milk with that of the animals in question i find ready to hand in dr miller's chemistry volume three the comparative statement of the mean of several analyses of the milk of woman cow goat ass sheep and bitch the latter is a moderately carnivorous animal nearly approaching the omnivorous character commonly ascribed to man the following is the statement first will be woman then cow goat ass sheep and bitch water eighty eight point six per cent eighty seven point four per cent eighty two per cent ninety point five per cent eighty five point six per cent and sixty six point three per cent fat two point six per cent four per cent four point five per cent one point four per cent four point five per cent and fourteen point eight per cent sugar and soluble salts four point nine per cent five per cent four point five per cent six point four per cent four point two per cent two point nine per cent nitrogenous compounds and insoluble salts three point nine per cent three point six per cent nine per cent one point seven per cent five point seven per cent sixteen per cent according to this it is quite evident that nature regards our food requirements as approaching much nearer to the herbivora than to the carnivora and has provided for us accordingly if we are to begin the building up of our bodies on a food more nearly resembling that of the herbivora than that of the carnivora it is only reasonable to assume that we should continue on the same principle the particulars of the difference are instructive the food which nature provides for the human infant differs from that provided for the young carnivorous animal just in the same way as flesh food differs from the cultivated and cooked vegetables and fruit within easy reach of man these contain less fat less nitrogenous matter more water and more sugar or starch which become sugar during digestion than animal food those who advocate the use of flesh food usually do so on the ground that it is more nutritious contains more nitrogenous material and more fat than vegetable food so much the worse for the human being says nature when she prepares the food but as a matter of practical fact there are no flesh eaters among us none who avail themselves of this higher proportion of albuminoids in fact we all practically admit every day in eating our ordinary english dinner that this excess of nitrogenous matter and fat is bad we do so by mixing the meat with that particular vegetable which contains an excess of the carbohydrates 
starch with the smallest available quantity of albuminoids and fat the slice of meat diluted with the lump of potato brings the whole down to about the average composition of a fairly arranged vegetarian repast when i speak of a vegetarian repast i do not mean mere cabbages and potatoes but properly selected well-cooked nutritious vegetable food as an example i will take count rumford's number one soup already described without the bread and in like manner take beef and potatoes without bread taking original weights and assuming the lump of potato weighed the same as the slice of meat we get the following composition according to the table given by pavey page four ten first will come water albumin starch sugar fat and then salts with lean beef we have seventy two nineteen point three no starch no sugar three point six and five point one the potatoes seventy five two point one eighteen point eight three point two point two and point seven for a total for the lean beef and potatoes one forty seven twenty one point four eighteen point eight three point two three point eight and five point eight the mean composition of mixture leads us to for water seventy three point five albumin ten point seven starch nine point four sugar one point six fat one point nine and salts two point nine rumford soup without the bread afterwards added was composed of equal measures of peas and pearl barley or barley meal in nearly equal weights their percentage composition as stated in the above named table is as follows peas fifteen per cent albumin twenty three starch fifty five point four sugar two fat two point one salts two point five for the barley meal fifteen six point three sixty nine point four four point nine two point four and two for a total for the peas and barley together thirty twenty nine point three one hundred and thirty four point eight six point nine five four point five and four point five the mean composition of mixture fifteen water fourteen point six five albumin sixty two point four starch three point four five sugar two point two five fat 2.25 salts here then in a hundred parts of the material of rumford's halfpenny dinner as compared with the mixed diet we have forty per cent more of nitrogenous food more than six and a half times as much carbohydrate in the form of starch more than double the quantity of sugar about seventeen per cent more of fat and only a little less of salts supplied by the salt which rumford added thus the mixed diet falls short in all the costly constituents and only excels by its abundance of very cheap water this analysis supplies the explanation of what has puzzled many inquirers and encouraged some sneerers at this work of the great scientific philanthropist viz that he allowed less than five ounces of solids for each man's dinner he did so and found it sufficient because he was supplying far more nutritious material than beef and potatoes his five ounces was more satisfactory than a pound of beef and potatoes three-fourths of which is water for which water john bull blindly pays a shilling or more per pound when he buys his prime steak rumford added the water at pump cost and by long boiling caused some of it to unite with the solid materials by the hydration i have described and then served the combination in the form of porridge raising each portion to nineteen and three-quarter ounces i might multiply such examples to prove the fallacy of the prevailing notions concerning the nutritive value of the mixed diet a fallacy which is merely an inherited epidemic a baseless physical superstition i will however just add one more example for comparison viz the highlander's porridge the following is the composition of oatmeal also from pavey's table water fifteen per cent albumin twelve point six per cent starch fifty eight point four sugar five point four fat five point six and salts three compare this with the beef and potatoes above and it will be seen that it is superior in every item excepting the water one hundred ounces of oatmeal contain one point nine ounce more of albumin 
than is contained in a hundred ounces of beef and potatoes mixed in equal proportions the one hundred ounces of oatmeal supplies thirty nine point six ounces more of carbohydrate starch the hundred ounces of oatmeal is superior to the extent of three point eight ounces in sugar it has the advantage by three point seven ounces in fat and point nine ounce in salts but the mixed diet beats the oatmeal by containing fifty eight and a half ounces more water nearly four times as much this deficiency is readily supplied in the cookery these figures explain a puzzle that may have suggested itself to some of my more thoughtful readers viz the smallness of the quantity of dry oatmeal that is used in making a large portion of porridge if we could in like manner see our portion of beef or mutton and potatoes reduced to dryness the smallness of the quantity of actually solid food required for a meal would be similarly manifest an alderman's banquet in this condition would barely fill a breakfast cup i cannot at all agree with those of my vegetarian friends who denounce flesh meat as a prolific source of disease as inflaming the passions and generally demoralizing neither am i at all disposed to make a religion of either eating or drinking or abstaining there are certain albinoids certain carbohydrates certain hydrocarbons and certain salts demanded for our substance excepting in fruit these are not supplied by nature in a fit condition for our use they must be prepared whether we do all the preparation in the kitchen by bringing the produce of the earth directly there or whether on account of our ignorance and incapacity as cooks we pass our food through the stomach intestines blood vessels etc of sheep and oxen as a substitute for the first stages of scientific cookery the result is about the same as regards the dietic result flesh feeding is a nasty practice but i see no grounds for denouncing it as physiologically injurious excepting in the fact that the liability to gout rheumatism and neuralgia is increased by it in my youthful days i was on friendly terms with a sheep that belonged to a butcher in germine street this animal for some reason had been spared in its lambhood it was reared as the butcher's pet it was well known in st james by following the butcher's men through the streets like a dog i have seen this sheep steal mutton chops and devour them raw it preferred beef or mutton to grass it enjoyed robust health and was by no means ferocious it was merely a disgusting animal with excessively perverted appetite a perversion that supplies very suggestive material for human meditation my own experience on myself and the multitude of other experiments that i am daily witnessing among men of all occupations who have cast aside flesh food after many years of mixed diet prove incontestably that flesh food is quite unnecessary and also that men and women who emulate the aforesaid sheep to the mild extent of consuming daily about two ounces of animal tissue combined with six ounces of water and dilute this with such weak vegetable food as the potato are not measurably altered thereby so far as physical health is concerned on economical grounds however the difference is enormous if all englishmen were vegetarians and fish eaters the whole aspect of the country would be changed it would be a land of gardens and orchards instead of gradually reverting to prairie grazing ground as at present the unemployed miserables of our great towns the inhabitants of our union workhouses and all our rogues and vagabonds would find ample and suitable employment in agriculture every acre of land would require three or four times as much labor as at present and feed five or six times as many people no sentimental exaggeration is demanded for the recommendation of such a reform as this end of section nineteen Section 20 of The Chemistry of Cookery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Chemistry of Cookery by W. Matthew Williams. Malted Food. A few years ago, the farmer's friends were very sanguine on the subject of using malt as cattle food. At agricultural meetings throughout the country, the iniquitous malt tax was eloquently denounced because it stood in the way of this great father reform. Then the malt tax was repealed, and forthwith the subject fell out of hearing. Why was this? The idea of malt feeding was theoretically sound, 
by the malting of barley or other grain its diastase is made to act upon its insoluble starch and to convert this more or less completely into soluble dextrin, a change which is absolutely necessary as a part of the business of digestion. Therefore, if you feed cattle on malted grain instead of raw grain, you supply them with a food so prepared that a part of the business of digestion is already done for them, and their nutrition is thereby advanced. From what I am able to learn, the reason why this hopeful theory has not been carried out is simply that it does not pay. The advantage in fattening the cattle is not sufficient to remunerate the farmers for the extra cost of the malted food. This may be the case with oxen but it does not follow that it should be the same with human beings. Cattle feed on grass, mangled bursels, etc., in their raw state, but we cannot, and, as I have already shown, we are not gramnivorous in the same manner they are. We cannot digest raw wheat, barley, oats, or maize. We cannot do this because we are not supplied with such effective natural grinding apparatus as they have in their mouths, and, further, because we have a much smaller supply of saliva and a shorter alimentary canal. We can easily supply our natural deficiencies in the matter of grinding, and do so by means of our flour mills. But at first thought, the idea of finding an artificial representative of the saliva of oxen does not recommend itself. When, however, it is understood that the chief active principle of the saliva so closely resembles the diastase of malt that it has received the name of animal diastase, and is probably the same compound, the aspect of the problem changes. Not only is this the case with the secretion from the glands surrounding the mouth, but the pancreas, which is concerned in a later stage of digestion, is a gland so similar to the salivary glands that in ordinary cookery both are dressed and served as sweetbreads. The pancreatic juice is a liquid closely resembling saliva and contains a similar diastase, or substance, that converts starch into dextrin, and from dextrin to sugar. Lehman says, it is now indubitably established that the pancreatic juice possesses this sugar-forming power in a far higher degree than the saliva. Besides this, there is another sugar-forming secretion, the intestinal juice, which operates on the starch of the food as it passes along the intestinal canal. This being the case, we should, in exercising our privilege as cooking animals, be able to assist the digestive functions of the saliva, the pancreatic and intestinal secretions, just as we help our teeth by the flour meal, and the means of doing this is offered by the diastase of malt. In accordance with this reasoning, I have made some experiments on a variety of our common vegetable foods, by simply raising them in contact with water to the temperature most favorable to the converting action of diastase, from 140 to 150 degrees Fahrenheit, and then adding a little malt extract or malt flour. This extract may be purchased ready-made, or prepared by soaking crushed or ground malt in warm water, leaving it for an hour or two or longer, and then pressing out the liquid. I find that oatmeal porridge, when thus treated, is thinned by the conversion of the bulk of its insoluble starch into soluble dextrin, that boiled rice is similarly thinned, that a stiff jelly of arrowroot is at once rendered watery and its conversion into dextrin is demonstrated by its altered action when a solution of iodine is added to it. It no longer becomes suddenly of a deep blue color as when it was a starch. Sago and tapioca are similarly changed, but not so completely as arrowroot. This is evidently because they contain a little nitrogenous matter and cellulose, which, when stirred, give a milkiness to the otherwise clear and limpid solution of dextrin. Pea spotting, when thus treated, behaves very instructively. Instead of remaining as a fairly uniform paste, it partially separates into paste and clear liquid, the paste being the cellulose and vegetable casein, the liquid a solution of the dextrin or converted starch. Mashed turnips, carrots, potatoes, etc. behave similarly, the general results showing that so far as the starch is concerned, there is no practical difficulty in obtaining a conversion of the starch into dextrin by means of a very small quantity of maltose. Hasty padding made of boiled flour is similarly altered. Generally speaking, the degree of visible alteration is proportionate to the amount of starch, but the more intimately it is mixed with the cellulose, the more slowly the change occurs. I have made malt porridge by using malt flour instead of oatmeal, 
I found it rather too sweet, but on mixing about one part of malt flour with four to eight parts of oatmeal, an excellent and easily digestible porridge is obtained, and one which I strongly recommend as a most valuable food for strong people and invalids, children and adults. Further details of these experiments would be tedious and are not necessary as they display no chemical changes that are new to science, and the practical results may be briefly stated without such details as follows. I recommend, first, the production of malt flour by grinding and sifting malted wheat, malted barley, or malted oats, or all of this, and the retailing of this at its fair value as a staple article of food. Every shopkeeper who sells flour or meal of any kind should sell this. Secondly, that this malted flour or the extract made from it as above described be mixed with the ordinary flour used in making pastry, biscuits, bread, etc., and with all kinds of porridge, pastry, pea soup, and other farinaceous preparations, and that when these are cooked, they should be slowly heated at first, in order that the maltose may act upon the starch at its most favorable temperature, from 140 to 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Thirdly, when practicable, such preparations as porridge, pea soup, pastry, etc. should be prepared by first cooking them in the usual manner, then stirring the malt meal or malt extract into them, and allowing the mixture to remain for some time. This time may vary from a few minutes to several hours or days, the longer the better. I have proved by experiments on boiled rice, oatmeal porridge, pea spudding, etc., that complete conversion may thus be affected. When the temperature of 140 to 150 degrees is carefully obtained, the work of conversion is done in half an hour or less. At 212 degrees, it is arrested. At temperatures below 140 degrees, it proceeds with a slowness varying with the depression of the temperature. The most rapid result is obtained by first cooking the food as above, then reducing the temperature to 150 degrees and adding the malt flour or malt extract and maintaining the temperature for a short time. The advantage of previous cooking is due to the preliminary breaking up and hydration of the starch granules. Fourthly, besides the malt meal or malt flour, I recommend the manufacture of what I may call pear malt, that is, malt treated as barley is treated in the manufacture of pear barley. The pearl malt may be largely used in soups, puddings, and for other purposes evident to the practical cook. It may be found preferable to the malt flour for some of the above-named purposes, especially for making a puree, like Ramford's soup. I strongly recommend such a soup to vegetarians. It's as the Ramford soup number one already described, but with the admixture of a little pearl malt with the pearl barley, or malt flour filling the pearl malt. A small proportion of malt, 1 20th, for example, has a considerable effect, but a larger amount is desirable. In all cases, this quantity may be regulated by experience, and according to whether a decided malt flavor is or is not preferred. I have not yet met with any malted maize commercially prepared, but my experiments on a small scale show that it is a very desirable product. As regards the action of vegetable diastase on cellulose, whether it is capable of breaking it up or affecting its hydration and conversion into digestible sugar, I am not yet able to speak positively, but the following facts are promising. I treated sago, tapioca, and rice with the maltose as above, and found that at a temperature of 140 to 150 degrees, all the starch disappears in about half an hour as proved by the iodine test. Still, the liquid was not clear. Floculi of cellulose, etc., were suspended in it. I kept this on top of a stove several days, where the temperature of the liquid varied from 100 to 180 degrees while the fire was burning, but fell to that of the atmosphere during the night. The quantity of the insoluble matter considerably diminished, but it was not entirely removed. This led me to make further experiments, still in progress, on the ensilage of human food with the aid of diastase. These experiments are on a small scale and are sufficiently satisfactory to justify more effective trials on a larger scale. It is well known that ordinary ensilage succeeds much better on a large than on a small scale, and I have no doubt that such will be the case with my diastase ensilage of oatmeal, peace padding, mashed roots, etc. I am also treating such vegetable food material with various acids for the same purpose.
when by this or other means we convert vegetable tissue into dextrin and sugar as it is naturally converted in the ripening pear, and as it has been artificially converted in our laboratories, we shall extend our food supplies in an incalculable degree. Sweets, turnips, mango bursels, etc. will become delicate diet for invalids. Horse beans, far more nutritious than beef, delicate biscuits and fancy pastry, as well as ordinary bread, will be produced from sodas and good shavings, plus a little leguminous flour to supplement the nitrogenous requirement. This may even be done now. Long ago, I converted an old pocket handkerchief and part of an old shirt into sugar, but not profitably as a commercial transaction. Other chemists have done the like in their laboratories. It is yet to be done in the kitchen. I should add that the sugar referred to in all of the above is not cane sugar, but the sugar corresponding to that in the grape and in honey. It is less sweet than cane or beet sugar, but it's a better food. I have already spoken of the difficulty presented by the opposite nature of the solvents demanded by the casein and the cellulose in my experiments on the ensilage of peace padding. The action of diastase indicates a possible solution of this difficulty. Let us suppose that a sufficient amount of potash is used to dissolve the casein, its solution separated as described in pages 218 and 219, the insoluble fibrous remainder treated with maltose or malt flour and its action allowed to proceed to fermentation and affecting the formation of acetic acid. Will this acid, by means of ensilage, act upon the cellulose as the acid of the unripe pear acts upon its cellulose? This is another of the questions that I can only suggest, not having had time and opportunity to supply experimental answer. Do fruits contain diastase? Two kinds of food are described by Pavai. Treatise on Food and Dietetics, page 227, in the preparation of which the conversion of a starch into dextrin appears to be affected. As I have no acquaintance with this, never met them either in Scotland or Wales, I will quote his description. Sowens, seeds, or flammery, which constitutes a very popular article of diet in Scotland and South Wales, is made from the husks of the grain, oats. The husks, with the starchy particles adhering to them, are separated from the other parts of the grain and steeped in water for one or two days, until the mass ferments and becomes sourish. It is then skimmed and the liquid boiled down to the consistence of gruel. In Wales, this food is called sukan. Budrum is prepared in the same manner, except that the liquid is boiled down to a sufficient consistency to form, when called, a firm jelly. This resembles blancmange and constitutes a light, demulcent, and nutritious article of food, which is well suited for the weak stomach. Here it is evident that solution takes place and a gummy substance is formed. This and the fermentation and sourish taste all indicate the action of the diastase of the seed converting the starch into dextrin and sugar, the later passing at once into acetic fermentation. Having only just met with this passage, I am unable to supply any experimental evidence, but suggest to any of my readers who may be on the spot where either of these preparations are made, the simple experiment of adding a little diluted tincture of iodine to the saw ones or budrum, preferably to the latter. If any of the starch remains as a starch, a deep blue tint will immediately struck. If this is not the case, it is all converted. I have just received a letter. While the proofs of this sheet are in course of correction, from a retired barrister in his 73rd year, who, after a successful career in India, retired in 1970 to enjoy the otium cum dig, among other interesting particulars relating to animal and vegetable diet, he tells me that, quote, Somehow I did not, with a purely vegetable diet, excite saliva sufficient for digestion, and being constitutionally a gouty subject, I have suffered very much from gout until comparatively lately, say the last eight months when an idea came into my head that by the use of potash I might get rid of the calcareous deposit accompanying gout and have been taking 30 drops of liquor potassium in my tea with very good effect. But within the last 10 days, thanks to your article in Knowledge of January 16, 1885, I have, as it were by magic, become young again. I was not aware that the diastase of malt had the same powers as the salivary secretions. When I read your article, I commenced the experiment on my morning food, namely oatmeal porridge, 
of which for several years I have cooked daily four ounces, of which I could never eat more than half without feeling distended for an hour or two, and then again feeling hungry and a craving for more food. Since I followed your directions, I have been able to eat comfortably nearly the whole, five ounces with the malt. I feel no distension for the time, nor craving afterwards. I am comfortably satisfied for hours. But what is more, the diastase porridge has had the effect of removing the tendency to costiveness, which was sore trouble, and it has rendered my joints supple, and destroyed the tendency of my finger and toenails to grow rapidly and brittle. All this seems to have changed as if by magic. I, therefore, write to you as a public benefactor, to thank you for your seasonable hints. End of quote. I quote this letter, with the permission of the writer, Mr. A.T.T. Peterson, the more willingly and confidently from the fact that I have lately adopted as a regular supper diet a porridge made of oatmeal, to which about one-sixth or one-eighth of malt flour is added, and find it in every respect advantageous, far better than ordinary simple oatmeal porridge. The following from Pavai, page 229, indicates further the desirability of assisting the salivary glands and the pancreas in digesting this otherwise excellent food. Speaking of oatmeal porridge, he says, quote, It is apt to disagree with some dyspeptics, having a tendency to produce acidity and pyrosis, and cases have been noticed among those who have been in the daily habit of consuming it, where dyspeptic symptoms have subsided upon temporarily abandoning its use. End of quote. My readers should try the following experiment. It supplies a striking demonstration of the potency of the diastase of malt. Make a portion of oatmeal porridge in the usual manner, but unusually thick, a pudding rather than a porridge. Then, while it is still hot, 150 degrees or thereabouts in the saucepan, add some dry malt flour, equal to one-eighth to one-fourth of the oatmeal used. Stir this dry flour into it and a curious transformation will take place. The dry flour, instead of thickening the mixture, acts like the addition of water and converts the thick pudding into a thin porridge. I find that this paradox greatly astonishes the practical cook. End of section 20. Section 21 of The Chemistry of Cookery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daniel MacDonald. The Chemistry of Cookery by W. Mateau Williams. The Physiology of Cooking. I have repeatedly spoken of the nitrogenous and non-nitrogenous constituents of food, assuming that the nitrogenous are more nutritious, are the plastic or flesh-building materials, and that the non-nitrogenous materials cannot build up flesh or bone or nervous matter, can only supply the material of fat, and, by their combustion, maintain the animal heat. In doing so, I have been treading on loose ground, I may say on a scientific quicksand. When I first taught practical physiology to children in Edinburgh many years ago, this part of the subject was much easier to teach than now. This simple and elegant theory of Liebig was then generally accepted and appeared quite sound. According to this, every muscular effort is performed at the expense of muscular tissue, every mental effort at the expense of cerebral tissue, and so on with all the forces of life. This consumption or degradation of tissue demands continual supplies of food for its renewal, and, as all the working organs of the animal are composed of nitrogenous tissue, it is clearly necessary, according to this, that we should be supplied with nitrogenous food to renew them, seeing that the nitrogen of the air cannot be assimilated by animals at all. But besides doing mechanical and mental work, the animal body is continually giving out heat, and its temperature must be maintained. Food is also demanded for this, and the non-nitrogenous food is the most readily combustible, especially the hydrocarbons or fats, the carbohydrates, starch, sugar, etc., also but in lower degree. These, then, were described as fuel food or heat producers. This view is strongly confirmed by a multitude of familiar facts. Men, 
horses and other animals cannot do continuous hard work without a supply of nitrogenous food. The harder the work, the more they require, and the greater becomes their craving for it. On the other hand, when such food is eaten in large quantities by idle people, they become victims of inflammatory disease, or their health otherwise suffers, according, probably, to whether they assimilate or reject it. Man is a cosmopolitan animal, and the variations of his natural demand for food in different climates affords very direct support to Liebig's theory. Enormous quantities of hydrocarbon, in the form of fat, are consumed by the Eskimo and by Europeans when they winter in the Arctic regions. They cannot live there without it. In hot climates, some fuel food is required, and the milder form of carbohydrates is chosen, and found to be most suitable. Rice, which is mainly composed of starch, is an example. Sugar also. Offer an Eskimo a tallow candle and a rice or tapioca pudding, he will reject the latter and eat the former with great relish. A multitude of other facts might be stated, all supporting Liebig's theory. There is one that just occurs to me as I write, which I will state, as it appears to have been hitherto unnoticed. Some organs which act in such wise that we can see their mode of action are visibly disintegrated and consumed by their own activity, and may be seen to demand the perpetual renewal described by Liebig. There are glands of cellular structure which cast off their terminal cells containing the fluid they secrete, do their work by giving up their own structural substance at their peripheral working surface. Where then is the quicksand? It is here. If muscular and mental work were done at the expense of the nitrogenous muscular and cerebral tissues, the quantity of nitrogen excreted should vary with the amount of work done. This was formerly stated to be the case without hesitation, as the following passage from Carpenter's Manual of Physiology, 3rd edition, 1856, page 256, shows, quote, Every action of the nervous and muscular systems involves the death and decay of a certain amount of the living tissue, as is indicated by the appearance of the products of that decay in the excretions. More recent experiments by Fick and Wislicenis, Parks, Houghton, Ronk, Voigt, Flint, and others are said to contradict this by showing that the waste nitrogen varies with the quantity of nitrogenous food that is eaten, but not with the muscular work done. For the details of these experiments, I must refer the reader to standard modern physiological treatises, as a full description of them would carry me too far away from my immediate subject. Dr. Pavi's treatise on food has an introductory chapter on the dynamic relations of food, in which this subject is clearly treated in sufficient detail for popular reading. It is quite the fashion now to rely upon these later experiments, but for my own part I am by no means satisfied with them, and for this reason that the excretions from the skin and from the lungs were not examined. It is just these which are greatly increased by exercise, and their normal quantity is very large, especially those from the skin, which are threefold, viz. the insensible perspiration which is transpired by the skin as invisible vapor, the sweat which is liquid, and the solid particles of exuded cuticle. Levosier and Sanguine long ago made laborious experiments upon themselves in order to determine the amount of the insensible perspiration. Sanguine enclosed himself in a bag of glazed taffeta, which was tied over him with no other opening than a hole corresponding to his mouth. The edges of this hole were glued to his lips with a mixture of turpentine and pitch. He carefully weighed himself and the bag before and after his enclosure therein his own loss of weight being partly from the lungs and partly from the skin. The amount gained by the bag represented the quantity of the latter. The difference between this and the loss of his own weight gave the amount exhaled from the lungs. He thus found that the largest quantity of insensible exhalation from the lungs and skin together amounted to 3.5 ounces per hour, or at the rate of 5.25 pounds per day. The smallest quantity was 1 pound 14 ounces, and the mean was 3 pounds 11 ounces. Three-fourths of this was cutaneous. These figures only show the quantity of insensible perspiration during repose. Valentin found that his hourly loss by cutaneous exhalation while sitting amounted to 32.8 grams, or rather less than one and a quarter ounce. On taking exercise with an empty stomach in the sun, the hourly loss increased to 89.3 grams, or nearly three times as much. 
after a meal, followed by violent exercise with the temperature of the air at 72 degrees Fahrenheit, it amounted to 132.7 grams, or nearly four and a half times as much as during repose. A robust man taking violent exercise in hot weather may give off as much as five pounds in an hour. The third excretion from the skin, the epithelial or superficial scales of the epidermis, is small in weight, but it is solid, and of similar composition to gelatin. It should be understood that this increases largely with exercise. The practice of sponging and rubbing down of athletes removes the excess, but I am not aware of any attempt that has been made to determine accurately the quantity thus removed. Does the skin excrete nitrogenous matter that may be, like urea, a product of the degradation of destruction of muscular tissue? Does the skin excrete nitrogenous matter that may be, like urea, a product of the degradation or destruction of muscular tissue? The following passage from Lemon's Physiological Chemistry, Volume 2, page 389, shows that the skin throws out plenty of nitrogen obtained from somewhere. Quote, It has been shown by the experiments of Millie, Jureen, Ingenhouse, Spallanzani, Abernathy, Beryl, and Collard de Martini that gases, and especially carbonic acid and nitrogen, are likewise exhaled with the liquid secretion of the pseudoparous glands. According to the last named experimentalist, the ratio between these two gases is very variable. Thus, in the gas developed after vegetable food, there is a preponderance of carbonic acid, and, after animal food, there is an excess of nitrogen. Abernathy found that on average, the collective gas contained rather more than two-thirds of carbonic acid and rather less than one-third of nitrogen, end quote. But it appears that less gas is exhaled when there is much liquid perspiration. Lemon's summary of the experiments of Abernathy, Brunner, and Valentin, volume 2, page 391, gives the amount of hourly exudation, under ordinary circumstances, as 50.71 grams of water, 0.25 of a gram of carbon, and 0.92 of a gram of nitrogen. This amounts to 21.5 grams of nitrogen per day in the insensible perspiration. Three quarters of an ounce are depois, or as much nitrogen as is contained in one pound and a half of natural living muscle. That the liquid perspiration contains compounds of nitrogen and just such compounds as would result from the degradation of nitrogenous tissue is unquestionable. As Lemon says, volume 2, page 389, quote, The sweat very easily decomposes and gives rise to the secondary formation of ammonia. Simon and Berzelius found salts of ammonia in the sweat. That the ammonia is combined both with hydrochloric acid and with organic acids that it probably exists as a carbonate of ammonia in alkaline sweat. The existence of urea in sweat appears to be uncertain. Some chemists assert its presence, others deny it. Farr and Scotton, for example, who have both studied this subject very carefully, are at direct variance. I suspect that both are right, as its presence or absence is variable and appears to depend on the condition of the subject of the experiment. Farr describes a special nitrogenous acid which he discovered in sweat, and names it hydrotic, or sudoric acid. Its composition corresponds, according to his analysis, to the formula C10H8NO13. I have summarized these facts, as they show clearly enough that the conclusions based on an examination of the quantity of nitrogen excreted by the kidneys alone, and such is the sole basis of the modern theories, are of little or no value in determining whether or not muscular work is accompanied with degradation of muscular tissue. The well-known fact that the total quantity of excretory work done by the skin increases with muscular work, while that from the kidneys rather diminishes, indicates in the plainest possible manner that an examination of the skin secretion should be primary in connection with this question. To entirely neglect this in such a research is a scientific parallel to the histronic feat of performing the tragedy of Hamlet with the Prince of Denmark omitted. Seeing that it has been entirely neglected, I am justified in expressing, very plainly and positively, my opinion of the worthlessness of all the modern research upon which the alleged refutation of Liebig's theory of the destruction and renewal of living tissue in the performance of vital work is based, and my rejection of the modern alternative hypothesis concerning the matter in which food supplies the material demanded for muscular and mental work. 
I may be accused of rashness and presumption in thus attempting to stem the overwhelming current of modern scientific progress. Such, however, is not the case. It is modern scientific fashion rather than scientific progress that I oppose. We have too much of this millinery spirit in the scientific world just now, too much eagerness to run after the last thing out, and assume, with undue readiness, that the latest researches are, of course, the best, especially where fashionable physicians are concerned. Having summarized Liebig's theory of the source of vital power and its supposed refutation by modern experiments, I will now endeavor to state the alternative modern hypothesis, though not without difficulty, nor with satisfactory result seeing that the recent theorists are vague and self-contradictory. All agree that vital power or liberated force is obtained at the expense of some kind of chemical action of a destructive or oxidizing character, and is, therefore, theoretically analogous to the source of power in a steam engine. But when they come to the practical question of the demand for working fuel or food, they abandon this analogy. Pavi says, in the Treatise on Food and Dietetics, page 6, quote, in the liberation of actual force, a complete analogy may be traced between the animal system and a steam engine. Both are media for the conversion of latent into actual force. In the animal system, combustible material is supplied under the form of the various kinds of food, and oxygen is taken in for the process of respiration. From the chemical energy due to the combination of these, force is liberated in an active state and, besides manifesting itself as heat, in other ways peculiar to the animal system. Besides manifesting itself as heat, and in other ways peculiar to the animal system, is capable of performing mechanical work. End quote. In another place, page 59 of the same work, after describing Liebig's views, Dr. Pavi says, quote, The facts which have been already adduced, note, those above described on the nitrogen eliminated by the kidneys, quote, suffice to refute this doctrine. Indeed, it may be considered as abundantly proved that food does not require to become organized tissue before it can be rendered available for force production, end quote. On page 81, he says, quote, while nitrogenous matter may be regarded as forming the essential basis of structures possessing active or living properties, the non-nitrogenous principles may be looked upon as supplying the source of power. The one may be spoken of as holding the position of the instrument of action, while the other supplies the mode of power. Nitrogenous elementary matter may be, it is true, by oxidation contribute to the generation of moving force, but, as it has been explained, in fulfilling this office, there is evidence before us to show that it is split up into two distinct portions, one containing the nitrogen, which is eliminated as useless, and a residuary, non-nitrogenous portion, which is retained and utilized in a force production, and a residuary, non-nitrogenous portion, which is retained and utilized in force production. End quote. The italics are mined for reasons presently to be explained. Pavi's work contains repetitions and further illustrations of this attribution of the origin of force to the non-nitrogenous elements of food. Then we have a statement of the experiments of Joule on the mechanical equivalent of heat, connected with experiments of Franklin and the apparatus that is used for determining the calorific value of coal, etc., viz., a little tubular furnace charged with a mixture of the combustible to be tested and chlorate of potash. This being placed in a tube open below, and thrust under water is fired, and gives out all its heat to the surrounding liquid, the rise of temperature of which measures the calorific value of the substance. See figure 7, page 21, simple treatise on heat. From this result is calculated the mechanical work obtainable from a given quantity of different food materials. That from a gram is given as follows. Beef fat at 27,778 units of work. Arrowroot starch at 11,983 units of work, lump sugar at 10,254 units of work, and grape sugar at 10,038 units of work. In Dr. Edward Smith's treatise on food, the foot-pound equivalent of each kind of food is specifically stated in such a matter as to lead the student to conclude that this represents its actual working efficiency as food. Other modern writers represent it in like manner. Here, then, comes the bearing of these theories on my subject. A practical dietary or menu is demanded, say, for navvies or athletes in full work. Another for sedentary people doing little work of any kind. 
According to the new theory, the best possible food for the first class is fat, butter, being superior to lean beef in the proportion of 14,421 to 2,829. Smith. And beef fat having nearly eight times the value of lean beef. 10 grains of rice gives 7,454 foot-pounds of working power, while the same quantity of lean beef gives only 2,829. According to which, one pound of rice should supply as much support to hard workers as two and a half pounds of beefsteak. None of the modern theorists dare to be consistent when dealing with such direct practical applications. I might quote a multitude of other palpable inconsistencies of the theory, which is so slippery that it cannot be firmly grasped. Thus, Dr. Pavi, page 403, immediately after describing bacon fat as, quote, the most efficient kind of force-producing material, end quote, and stating that, quote, the non-nitrogenous alimentary principles appear to possess a higher dietetic value than the nitrogenous, end quote, tells us that, quote, the performance of work may be looked upon as necessitating a proportionate supply of nitrogenous alimentary matter, end quote, and his reason for this admission being that such nitrogenous material is required for the nutrition of the muscles themselves. A pretty tissue of inconsistency is thus supplied. Non-nitrogenous food is the best force producer. It corresponds to the fuel of the steam engine. The nitrogenous is necessary only to repair the machine. Nevertheless, when force production is specially demanded, the food required is not the force producer, but the special builder of muscles. The which muscles, according to theory, are not used up and renewed in doing the work. It must be remembered that the whole of this modern theoretical fabric is built upon the experiments which are supposed to show that there is no more elimination of nitrogenous matter during hard work than during rest. Yet we are told that, quote, the performance of work may be looked upon as necessitating a proportionate supply of nitrogenous alimentary matter, end quote, and that such material, quote, is split up into two distinct portions, one containing the nitrogen, which is eliminated as useless, end quote. This thesis is proved by experiments showing, as asserted, that such elimination is not so proportioned. In short, the modern theory presents us with the following pretty paradox. The consumption of nitrogenous food is proportionate to the work done. The elimination of nitrogen is not proportionate to the work done. The elimination of nitrogen is proportionate to the consumption of nitrogenous food. I have tried hard to obtain a rational physiological view of the modern theory. When its advocates compare our food to the fuel of an engine and maintain that its combustion directly supplies the moving power, what do they mean? They cannot suppose that the food is thus oxidized as food, yet such is implied. The work cannot be done in the stomach, nor in the intestinal canal, nor in the mesenteric glands, nor in their outlet, the thoracic duct. After leaving this, the food becomes organized living material, the blood being such. The question, therefore, as between the new theory and that of Liebig, must be whether work is affected by the combustion of the blood itself or by the degradation of the working tissues, which are fed and renewed by the blood. Although this is so obviously the only rational physiological question, I have not found it thus stated. Such being the case, the supposed analogy to the steam engine breaks down altogether. The food is certainly assimilated, it is converted into the living material of the animal itself before it does any work, and therefore it must be the wear and tear of the machine itself which supplies the working power, and not that of the food as mere fuel material shoveled directly into the animal furnace. I thus agree with Playfair, who says that the modern theory involves a, quote, false analogy of the animal body to a steam engine, end quote, and that, quote, incessant transformation of the acting parts of the animal machine forms the condition for its action, while in the case of the steam engine, it is the transformation of the fuel external to the machine which causes it to move, end quote. Pavi says that, quote, Dr. Playfair, in these utterances, must be regarded as writing behind the time, end quote. He may be behind as regards to the fashion, but I think he is in advance as regards to the truth. My readers, therefore, need not be ashamed of clinging to the old-fashioned belief that their own bodies are alive throughout, and perform all the operations of working, feeling, thinking, etc., by virtue of their own inherent self-contained vitality, and that in doing this, they consume their own substance, which has to be perpetually replaced by new material, 
its quality depending on the manner of working and the matter and manner of replacement. The course of our own evolution thus depends upon ourselves. We may, according to our own daily conduct, be building up a better body and a better mind, or one that shall be worse than the fair promise of the original germ. Therefore, the philosophy of the preparation of the material of which the body and brain are built up and renewed must be worthy of careful study. This philosophy is the chemistry of cookery. End of section 21 End of The Chemistry of Cookery by W. Mateau Williams